Where would you put the most dangerous prisoner in all of America? What lengths would you go to to keep him locked down? Barbed wire, steel doors, motion sensors, guard dogs, sharpshooters? In his cell, how many liberties and basic necessities could you strip away and whittle down while still keeping him alive? At what point did you cross the line from detention to torture? We've all seen Alcatraz, a huge looming block of cells isolated on an island. The waters are icy, the currents are vicious. Even if you could somehow break out of your cell and off the island, you'd drown or be thrown against the rocks before you made it halfway to the mainland. What if we told you that there's a prison that's even more severe, a facility that's infamous for its utter inescapability, where prisoners will spend decades of their lives in the same two concrete rooms, never breathing fresh air, never feeling sunlight on their faces, a place where you'd send the man so dangerous that human contact is strictly off limits at all times. Welcome to Florence Admax. Nicknamed the Alcatraz of the Rockies, this supermax prison was built near Florence, Colorado to be for the worst of the worst. Go anywhere near the 37-acre site and you'll see watchtowers dotting the landscape. In those towers, you won't find just lookouts, you'll see sunlight glinting off the scopes of sniper rifles. Beneath the ground at your feet are hidden pressure pads. Sweeping the area are an undisclosed number of laser beams, detecting any kind of motion. A team of highly trained guard dogs patrol the grounds constantly, ready to chase down any escapees at the drop of a hat. But before we can even use the word escape seriously, you need to consider what's on the other side of the 12-foot-high razor wire fences encircling the whole facility. Floodlights illuminate the entire place day and night. Motion detectors watch most of the ground, but anywhere they can't see, you can bet will be covered by the extensive network of security cameras, each one remote controlled. There are no external windows to bust out of, at least none larger than a few inches and equally as thick. Your best bet would be to get out one of the doors. Should be doable. There are only 1,400 of them, each one reinforced steel. The concept of breaking out of Florence Admax is about as close to an impossibility as it can get. You would need nothing short of US military to get in or out of that place if they didn't want you to. Looking at it from above, we can see the different blocks. There are general population units Delta, Echo, Fox, and Gulf, where most of the prison's approximately 350 inmates are housed. Then there's the Special Housing Unit SHU, used for solitary confinement, where inmates may be moved temporarily as punishment for bad behavior. But wait, it gets worse, much worse. Beyond the SHU is the Control Unit, where gang leaders are housed, cutting them off from their followers, as well as the kind of prisoners who tend to incite violence in the larger units. Here you'll find some of the most notorious gang leaders Chicago and New York have ever seen. James Little Jimmy Marcello, who has a decades-long rap sheet of extortion, loan sharking, and murder, is neighbors with Omar O.G. Mac Porti, who founded the Nine Trey Gangsters and the Unique Blood Nation while in Rikers. But they're nothing compared to the main man on the block, Joaquin Archivaldo Guzman Loera. You probably know him by his other name, El Chapo. Under his rule, the cartel raked in at least $3 billion per year in revenue. Experts have estimated that around 25% of all illegal drugs that entered the U.S. via Mexico come through El Chapo's ring. He was such a danger that the city of Chicago branded him as public enemy number one, the first of that title since Al Capone. That's got to be the worst of the worst right there. You can't get much higher security than El Chapo, right? Wrong. Beyond the control unit is the Special Security Unit, or H Unit. It's here that America sends some of its most dangerous terrorists, people who have special rules and regulations made just for them due to the nature of their crimes. In those cells, you'll find some of the most infamous murderers, terrorists, and serial killers in US history. The Unabomber, Theodore Kaczynski, was here all the way up to 2021, past his cell, serving three life terms plus 110 years in prison without parole, is the shoe bomber, Richard Reed, who tried to take down a transatlantic flight in 2001 with an explosive in his shoe. Former FBI agent turned Soviet spy Robert Philip Hansen is serving 15 consecutive life sentences just around the corner. Seeing the conditions in Guantanamo Bay, it's apparent just how detested terrorists are in the United States prison system. But that's a video for another day. Unit H must be the final stage in the Supermax prison, the most secure wing for the most dangerous prisoners. But no. There is one more. Prison officers describe the place as a cleaner version of hell. The smallest unit in the whole complex, it has just four cells. This is range 13. In all of the prison's 30-year history, 
We only publicly know of three men who have been held here, and it is here we'll find a prisoner so dangerous that this entire facility was designed because of his actions. The prisoner who holds the record for the second longest time spent in solitary confinement in U.S. prison history, beaten only by Albert Woodfox, who was kept in solitary for 43 years. It's the former leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, Thomas Edward Silverstein. We'll give you a tour of his cell soon enough, but first we should dive into what one man can possibly do that's so heinous that he's barred from any and all human contact for the rest of his life multiple times over. Terrible Tom Silverstein was born February 4, 1952, in Long Beach, California. Even before he was born, his life was in turmoil. His mother, Virginia, was having an affair with a man named Thomas Conway. As an adult, Tommy claimed that Thomas Conway was his biological father, which is likely part of what led Virginia to divorce her husband and remarry Conway before little Tommy was even born. Born Thomas Conway, named after his mother's brand new husband, the little boy didn't have long to get used to his family life before it was upended again. The marriage broke down, and by Tommy's fourth birthday he had another father, a man named Sid Silverstein. Silverstein adopted the boy as his own and passed on his surname, but it was clear from a young age that Tommy Silverstein was not going to live an easy life. Virginia was a drinker. The more she drank, the more violent she'd become, something Thomas would become more familiar with. One of Silverstein's earliest memories was a time when he had wet the bed. His mother flew into a rage and grabbed a paper cup from the kitchen. She demanded that he pee into the cup and then drink it. She warned him that this was going to happen every time he wet the bed from that point on. Silverstein was incredibly timid growing up, always shying away from other kids and not wanting to engage at school. The other kids, having heard the Jewish surname Silverstein and seeing him as a weak target, started to pick on him. This anti-Semitic bullying started from a young age. Tommy returned home from school one day with a bloody nose, which was the work of an older boy named Gary. The next day, Virginia waited outside the school for Gary to leave. When she saw him, she grabbed the boy and held him still, demanding that Tommy punch him in the face as hard as he could. Tommy did what he was told. The next day, Gary's father tried to return the favor, snatching Tommy on his way home, but the boy escaped and ran home. That night, in a drunken rage, Virginia took Tommy to Gary's family's home and threw bricks through the windows. The lesson she was doing her best to drill into him was that violence was always the solution, and any kind of vulnerability was weakness, and she would not have a weak son. It was Tommy's job to do the worst jobs in the house. Virginia had a chihuahua who would defecate everywhere, so she decided it was her son's job to clean it up for her. One day, as he was doing the job, the dog bit him on the hand. This time, it was Tommy's turn to fly into a rage. He hauled the dog outside and hung it from the tree by its leash lynching the animal to within an inch of its life. Realizing the horror of what he was doing, Tommy let it go and cradled the dog in his arms as it panted feebly on the edge of death. At that moment, looking down at the dog, Tommy saw himself, but something else clicked too. As much as he felt like a monster for what he had done, he just couldn't help but savor the sweet taste of revenge. That dog was smaller than him. For the first time in his life, he was bigger and tougher. Sure enough, once Tommy got into high school, the table started to turn. He hit a growth spurt and soon towered over his mom. Just before his 15th birthday, Tommy snuck out of the bedroom in the middle of the night. He knew where Sid kept the shotgun, and he tiptoed over to the weapon, peering at it in the light from the street lamps coming through the window. Reaching out a trembling hand, Tommy took the gun, surprised by how heavy it was. Quietly as he could, he crept into his mom's room, where she and Sid were lying fast asleep. Tommy took a deep breath and walked over to her side of the bed. Looking down at her from his new height, he felt hatred filling his entire being. Gently as he could, he raised the shotgun and laid the barrel perfectly under her chin. His hands were trembling, but his mind was surprisingly steady. He pulled the trigger. Click. The gun was empty. Tommy let out a shaky breath, took the gun away from his mother's head and put it back where he found it. The next day at breakfast, he didn't talk about what had happened, but he sat there, feeling a strange sense of peace. He could do it. He knew that now. He had what it took to kill her if he wanted to. From that moment on, he fought back. He wouldn't put up with his mother's aggression any longer. He'd fight with Sid whenever the man would try to discipline him. Despite having the man's surname, Tommy had never seen Sid as his real father. He'd always remained attached to Thomas Conway, who for much of his life had been in and out of prison. Everybody was poor, but Thomas Conway always had schemes to try to change that. At age 19, Tommy Silverstein got roped into a chain of events that would change his life forever. Thomas Conway was in the robbery game armed robbery to be specific. He liked to have a crew with him to hit target spots hard and get out quickly. 
Looking for new recruits, he brought along Tommy as a new recruit, but the robbery went wrong. They got caught, and Tommy was locked up in San Quentin Prison in California. Four years later, Tommy got paroled, but rather than try to turn his life around, he committed to the job, going out for another string of robberies with his father. This time, when they got caught, the sentence was much more severe. Now 23, and a repeat offender for armed robbery, Tommy was given a much harsher sentence of 15 years. A young man now, he wouldn't be out of prison until he was nearly 40. When he was to get out, what could he even do? Who could he be? Starting your life at 38 with little education, a criminal record, childhood trauma, and the life experience of a 23-year-old is a bleak future indeed. For all intents and purposes, Tommy's life became a prison. The four walls around him became the limits of his existence, and like an animal raised in a zoo, he adjusted to his environment. Tommy was sent to prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, with a fierce racial gang culture inside. Tommy found acceptance in the Aryan Brotherhood. No longer was he being picked on for kids thinking he was Jewish. Now he was the bully. This was in the late 70s and early 80s, so heroin usage was rampant in the prison system. Tommy was involved in trafficking it around, a job he found he was pretty good at. It wasn't Tommy's first experience like this. When he was 14, Tommy had been sent off to the California Youth Authority Reformatory, a facility designed to reform young teenagers and change them from their ways before it was too late. The reality was almost the total opposite. When talking about the place near the end of his life, Tommy said that all it did was reinforce the lessons he learned as a kid. In his own words, anyone not willing to fight was abused. But one day in Leavenworth, somebody said no to him. Danny Atwell, a fellow prisoner, refused to be a heroin mule for the Aryan Brotherhood. Tommy dealt with the situation the only way he knew how. He stabbed Danny Atwell to death, allegedly. You see, while this conviction was later overturned in 1985, as it came to light that those giving evidence against Silverstein were lying, it was enough to have him transferred to more secure confinement at USP Marion, Illinois, with a life sentence added to his time behind bars. He was placed in the control unit, essentially solitary confinement, when he arrived as he was deemed to be a highly disruptive and dangerous presence. At Marion, he had a ceiling light in his cell that would be on permanently so that the security cameras pointed at him wouldn't miss a thing. He struggled to sleep and reported that the prison guards were antagonistic and cruel to him. In 1981, Silverstein was on trial again. This time, it was for killing Robert Chappelle, a member of the DC Blacks gang. Much like his first trial, this was based on witness statements, which Silverstein had strenuously denied for all of his life. This murder had caused a real stir throughout the prison, which was only made worse when one of the leaders of the DC Blacks gang was transferred from another prison entirely and put just a couple of doors down from Silverstein. With the trial still dragging on, Raymond Lee Cadillac Smith arrived at USP Marion and immediately made threats that he was going to kill Tommy Silverstein the first chance he got. Silverstein protested his innocence, but it fell on deaf ears. The guards in the prison did little to keep the two men apart. Silverstein even believed that they were deliberately putting the men together all the time in the hopes they would kill each other. And sure enough, it happened. Silverstein, along with his friend Clayton Fountain, stabbed Cadillac 67 times. They then paraded his body up and down the walkways outside of the cells, showing everybody in prison exactly what they had done and why they weren't to be messed with. You're either the bully or the victim. Silverstein had made up his mind about which he'd be. Another life sentence was added to his time, confirming that Tommy Silverstein would never be a free man again. So, he got used to life inside. One hobby he took up was painting. But little did he know that this was to be the start of the worst years of his life. United States prisons have a rule that any artwork created by prisoners that depicts murder is to be confiscated and destroyed. Tommy had a number of his paintings taken away from him, for what we may never know. The officer responsible was Merle Klutz. Not only did Tommy hate the man for taking his artwork away, but he alleged the man had been harassing him and bullying him without anyone stepping in to do anything about it. So, he decided to do something about it. Walking behind Klutz one day, Tommy had another prisoner sneak him a homemade key to his cuffs and a shank. He leaped at Klutz and stabbed him to death before the other officers could pull him away. Just a few hours later, his friend Clayton Fountain did the exact same thing to another officer. The prison was placed on lockdown immediately. This ran the risk of getting out of control fast. Prison stabbings were common, but when it was between prisoners, it was often seen as an acceptable casualty. That was just the natural order. But when the prisoners started stabbing guards, that could start a riot that would threaten the security of the entire facility. 
If prisoners suddenly started seeing their guards as vulnerable, able to be killed, what's to stop them from doing that at every opportunity? The prison system needed to send a message, to make an example of Tommy Silverstein. USP Marion's lockdown was indefinite, lasting for 23 years in total. Silverstein was sent to Atlanta where he was placed in solitary, with strict instructions that he was to have zero human contact. But in the background, larger pieces were starting to fall in place. The BOP began working in earnest on a new project, a new supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, that was to be the ultimate deterrent. Silverstein was in his cell 23 hours a day on his own for close to four years, until all of a sudden his door was opened. It was 1987. Cuban detainees had rioted and taken control of the prison what became known as the Atlanta Prison Riots. The Cubans unlocked Silverstein's cell and allowed him to walk freely through the facility, where he eventually found the guards who were being held as hostages. Silverstein knelt down in front of one of them and began to talk. Aware of Silverstein's history, the Cubans were growing nervous. Those hostages were negotiating power. If the guards were to be killed, they'd have nothing protecting them from the military storming the facility and putting the riot to a painful end. Fortunately for them, the guard Silverstein was talking to was his favorite. The man had always made a point of asking Silverstein if his handcuffs were too tight and loosening them if they were. Wiping the sweat from their brows, the Cubans released Silverstein, sending him to the hostage negotiation team outside before he could do any damage. He was transferred back to Leavenworth for 18 more years until eventually the security status of that prison was downgraded. But fortunately, a new facility was up and running now. It was one of the most secure prisons in all of human history, with a cell made specifically for punishment and deterrence, ADX Florence, specifically a cell in range 13. At this point, Tommy Silverstein already spent 22 years in solitary confinement, but in Florence it was about to get a whole lot worse. Welcome to Tommy Silverstein's cell in range 13. Every inch of this cell has specifically been designed to do the bare minimum possible to sustain human life and to remove any last sliver of connection with the outside world. The cell is just 3.5 meters by 2 meters, or 12 feet by 7 feet. The total floor space with the room's curved wall amounts to 80 square feet. That's the smallest legal limit for a New York City kitchen. The bed is made from concrete. There's a stool at the foot of the bed, also made from concrete. The toilet bowl itself is made as part of the wall, also concrete. There's an open shower in the corner of the room, so close to the bed that any shower will inevitably wet the bedding. The water is on a timer, activated by a push of a button. On the wall at the head of the bed is a window. The window is just 4 inches wide with incredibly thick reinforced glass. In reality, it's more of a slit to allow light through. Tommy Silverstein was to spend 23 hours per day there, receiving food through a slot in the door. The instructions from his previous detention center carried over. Zero human contact. For the other hour in the day, he was taken to what's called the empty swimming pool. This room had marginally more space than his cell, but with much less inside. It was just an empty room. The one feature that made it equivalent to having outdoor time was a 4x4 four four inch skylight in the ceiling. If Tommy behaved, he would be given books to read and eventually a small black and white TV. He could have two phone calls per month. Aside from that, he was on his own. But there is a big question that we haven't answered in all of this. Why him? ADX Florence houses prisoners like El Chapo and the Unabomber, gang leaders and terrorists. Tommy Silverstein was locked up for armed robbery and committed up to three murders. These are obviously awful crimes, but they pale in comparison to running a drug empire larger than dozens of countries' GDPs. The truth is that Tommy Silverstein was there to send a message. An unnamed prison officer, talking to author Pete Early, explained it bluntly. When an inmate kills a guard, he must be punished. We can't execute Silverstein, so we have no choice but to make his life a living hell. Otherwise, other inmates will kill guards too. There has to be some supreme punishment. Every convict knows what Silverstein is going through. We want them to realize that if they cross the same line that he did, they will pay a heavy price. Silverstein's case is a controversial one. The punishment in comparison to the crimes is extreme. Over the course of his lifetime, Tommy Silverstein spent a total of 36 years in those conditions. Eclipsing the sentences of people who have done far worse crimes, had stronger evidence and shown less remorse. As humans, we tend to argue that everyone's life is equally valid but it is clear that the who of Silverstein's victim is the reason for his punishment. If he had killed another prisoner, no one would have batted an eyelid. Yet, because it's a guard, he's now infamous and the subject of a number of human rights complaints. The prison system rightly or wrongly has taken extreme actions against one individual to make him a symbol for other prisoners of what happens when they step out of line. 
Much like all of Silverstein's childhood, it comes down once again to who is the biggest and the strongest. You're either the bully or the victim. In this case, the prison system has chosen to be the bully. They have time and again within these facilities where guards exercise their powers unfairly to keep prisoners in line. Tommy Silverstein, by the end of his life, claimed to have been reformed. He talked openly over the phone about how self-reflection, meditation, and Buddhism had shown him the damage he had caused and the errors of his previous life. A foundation was set up by his family to campaign for reform to prevent what was happening to him from happening to others. This begs the question of what prison is for in the first place. Is it to reform convicts, to educate them and show them right from wrong so they can be released as productive members of society? Or is it there to punish them, to serve justice for the crimes that they have committed and act as a deterrent to scare others from doing the same? Is prison for the people inside it at all, or is it for those on the outside? To help the general population feel safe at night and scare the criminals straight at the thought of being caught. Tommy Silverstein had his own views on these questions. Even though we may not execute people by the masses, as they do in other countries, our government leaders bury people alive for life in cement tombs. It's actually more humane to execute someone than it is to torture them year after year after year. It's hard to know the kind of trauma, mental illness, and fury that could drive somebody to commit the kinds of crimes for which these prisoners are responsible. For many of them, their crimes are like flames licking out of the windows of a burning apartment block as the true inferno rages inside. Their actions are the lashings out of a dark mind twisted beyond recognition. Any of us would find it unbearable to be left alone with just our thoughts for more than a few days. Imagine how it would feel to be alone in that concrete box with only that kind of mind for company year after year, decade after decade. Would death be less cruel? At what point does a monster become a victim? And at what point do the men punishing him become themselves monsters? A 20-year-old man, a man who believes he has become a victim of the justice system in the US, wants out. In the psych ward where he's been placed, he bides his time until he sees his chance to get into a medical cabinet. The man has no problem picking locks. He'll pick many locks for many years to come. Inside that cabinet is a bottle of the extremely potent psychotropic substance called LSD. He takes the bottle of that and again, when the time is right, he sneaks into the staff room and pours the entire bottle into a pot of boiling coffee. The ingoing and outgoing staff are all going to get a hit. A hit you could call heroic. In his own words, the man later said the plan was when all the people were freaked out enough, I was going to pick the locks and go. A few aides and staff on the ward between them unwittingly took acid to the amount of around 100 tabs. Perhaps you're not the type of person who knows much about things like LSD, but let us tell you 100 tabs between a handful of people would have caused them to hallucinate wildly. The plan didn't exactly go how that guy wanted it to go. Far from it. Not long after those coffees were drunk, one aide was down in the basement watching the clothes dryer spin around and around. His pupils were now large black shimmering discs, and he stared at that spinning drum and just lost his mind. The machine became his mortal enemy. The aide screamed at the dryer, he threw punches at it, kicked it. While upstairs in the ward, people were tripping out of their minds. One of the female psychiatric doctors didn't seem to know where she was or who she was. She was seen madly dancing up and down the ward and, in a sexually suggestive way, informing the shocked inmates about how deliriously hot she was feeling. The scene was a phantasmagoria of horror and comedy, but during all that utter madness, the plotter and executor of that communal trip could not make his escape. Security was soon called and the staff were taken to some place to calm down from their mega trip. A clothes dryer had been ripped apart and in one man's eyes, defeated. Welcome to the life of Mark DeFreist, the Houdini of Florida, a masterful escape artist, a veritable genius who just couldn't find his way in life. A life that from the outside might look part comedy, but in reality, his life sentence on this earth has been filled mostly with a devastating tragedy. Mark was born in 1960 and grew up with his father and stepmom. His father had served during the Second World War in the OSS, an organization that would later evolve into the CIA. Father and son were close, and the former imparted his vast knowledge to the latter. This would serve Mark well in his many prison escapes. But the child was different. Some say he was a savant. Most others now say he was a high-functioning autistic and still is today. Mark didn't understand much about the world and didn't socialize much with other kids. He spent most of his time by himself and he despised school. They moved him to a disciplinary boys school to temper the child's waywardness, but he ran away, something he would keep doing his entire life. 
All he really wanted to do was take things apart and put them back together again. At the back of the house there was a workshop, something Mark would later call his Frankenstein's lab. There he would mess around with chemicals, blowing himself up on two occasions, and he would rewire appliances, take apart clocks, all with the skill and dexterity of a seasoned expert. His life fell apart when he was 19. His father died, and knowing what Mark loved most, he bequeathed all his tools to him. This was the start of the beginning of tragedy because Mark, not really knowing how wills work, took the tools before that will had been probated. That just means made valid. His cold and stony stepmother, a woman who had never cared for Mark, called the cops. Those cops chased Mark down one night, and on seeing those flashing lights, this young man who didn't quite get how things worked in society fled on foot. He had no idea why those cops were after him. He had no idea about how wills were supposed to be dealt with. He was arrested and charged with theft, and also got a charge for being in possession of a weapon. Next came jail. This just didn't seem fair to the young man, a guy that thought he'd taken what was rightly his. One day after Bible study class, he and the other inmates were being led back to their cells, when some men just started running for it, heading to the razor wire fence. None of them got over, but Mark knew exactly how to scale such a fence because his father once taught him how it could be done. Mark then hotwired a car, hit the road, and settled into a motel for the night. This was his problem. He understood the technical aspects related to escape, but he didn't have the noose, the worldliness, the social intellect to evade the authorities for long. He got six more charges after that. He went back to jail, where he was jumped by 14 inmates who didn't quite understand this weird kid who didn't fit in but wasn't afraid to talk back to them. Those 14 so-called tough guys beat him badly and sexually abused him. After that, Mark slit his wrists. He hit his head against the cell door. He screamed and shouted all day long, and soon he was taken to that psych ward where he would spike a coffee pot with an entire bottle of LSD. The prison system and the justice system thought that what they had was an unruly kid who'd been lucky to get over a razor wire fence. They didn't much like the inmate. He was troublesome, he used bad language, and he would often not do as he was told. For that, over the years, Mark would be beaten time and again by the guards. He had to escape, that's all he ever thought about. You have to see, in his mind, a mind that worked differently from most people's, he'd only taken his father's tools, and those tools had been given to him. The escapes, to Mark's reasoning, were not crimes, but the right thing to do. He was, in fact, just being very rational. Tools equal mine, imprisonment equals wrong, escape equals right. One day, he was asked if he'd like to join a new woodwork and arts crafts activity. Of course he would. This was a guy that was brilliant at making things, but when Mark saw rolled up copper sheets, the first thing that came to his mind was, they really mustn't want me to stay. That's because what he saw in the workshop were all the necessary bits and pieces to fashion a homemade gun, aka a zip gun. With the copper, he made the gun barrel and then he fixed that to a homemade pistol grip. When he had the gun ready, the next thing he did was steal an ice pick and take that back to his cell. He took that spike and ripped out one of his back teeth. With blood streaming from his mouth, he called a nurse and he was rushed to the psych ward prison hospital, albeit in handcuffs and leg chains. The dentist knew right away that this was an act of self-mutilation, and that's what he added to his report. After seeing the dentist, Mark asked if he could go for a pee. In the bathroom, he picked his locks again and produced his homemade gun. Pointing his zip gun at the guards, he shouted, anybody move and I'll blow your brains out. Some inmates in that ward, perhaps not in good mental shape, started jumping around and screaming. Mark shot a table just to prove to them his gun actually worked. After that, he was gone again, out the door and running through the nearby woods. But again, he just didn't quite know how to stay out. He stole yet another car but was soon caught. He was now making the headlines of local news media, but the prison system, they were starting to get pretty mad at the kid. He'd had his chances, now they wanted him to suffer. And suffer he did, in jail, while the authorities tried to figure out if this kid was mentally fit to stand trial. They kept him locked down for 24 hours a day. Was he fit to stand trial? Four psychiatrists said no. No way, he's mentally ill, this man doesn't know what's right or wrong. Sure, he understands the court system and he's not raving mad, in fact, he's obviously very talented, but still, he doesn't know why he's here at all. He should not stand trial. One man said that wasn't the case, calling Mark a malingerer, meaning someone pretending to be mentally unwell. That same man decades later changed his mind. That didn't help the 20-year-old Mark who was sent back to jail. There he made another gun, an improved version of his last zip gun, even though for this one he had to use an empty roll of toothpaste. I was in my gunsmith phase, I could make a gun out of anything, Mark would later recall. This time he threatened the guards, and just to make sure the gun was working, he fired it at a wall. It was working alright, and many other inmates saw that Mark had not shot anywhere near the guards. But enough was enough. The guards beat Mark within an inch of his life and forced him into a pitch black cell, naked, bruised, and broken. 
After 11 days of that, he took a plea deal without really knowing what a plea deal was. For firing at the wall, he was convicted of attempted murder. Later, he was sent to the Florida State Prison, a prison that at the time was said to be totally ungovernable, a prison where violence and murder was commonplace. No inmate in the US ever wanted to end up there. It confined the so-called worst of the worst, but as prisons go, it was the worst of the worst. Mark was still occasionally unruly. He still didn't really understand the prison system or the prison code, and he was beaten severely by both guards and inmates on many occasions, and so he started making homemade weapons. When they were found, he went back into the hole. His solitary confinement was often a life of total isolation. The order given by the prison authorities was no clothes for the prisoner, no mattress or sheets. Conversation with anyone was prohibited which included prison trustees. He was given no toiletries, no tissues, no toothpaste, no soap. They turned off the water in his cell at times and he couldn't even flush the toilet. He had to eat with his hands and in the total darkness. The torture and humiliation was later compared to what happened at Guantanamo Bay. He had to live in silence and darkness, naked, like a trapped animal. And if that's not cruel and unusual punishment, then what is? His punishment was nothing short of medieval, and arguably a form of modern-day torture. The prison put him on a consolidated security list, so when he wasn't in total darkness, he still wasn't allowed out of his cell. In his own words, he said, you can go two, three, four, five, six, seven years without ever seeing the yard. In total, he had ten years of requests to see the sun, and they were all denied. But he still caught sight of the guards, and what he would do is study their keys. After examining them, he'd memorize the cuts in the keys and then make his own set out of paper. I made keys for every lock in America, he said many years later. Did he ever get to use them? Well, Mark attempted to escape 13 times in all, and he was successful 7 times. One time he scaled the fence and broke both his feet. He somehow managed to hotwire a truck, ram a police roadblock, and then after a high-speed chase, ended up driving the truck into someone's living room. They were really upset, he later said, about the people whose house he'd driven into. He had hundreds of disciplinary reports, but he's never hurt anyone else. They were usually for minor infractions, or for being found with weapons he was keeping to protect himself in the ultra-violent places where he was housed. His story became public, and the majority of the public now say that this is a man who has some mental issues who's been chewed up by the prison system right from the first year when he was brutally beaten and sexually abused by a gang of inmates. He was paroled on February 5, 2019 on the condition that he spend a year in a mental health and substance abuse center. Over the years, he developed dependencies on the many drugs he received in prison. After only a few days, he started showing signs of bipolar mania, and his kidneys were failing him. He also tested positive for methamphetamine. Mark was subsequently sent back to jail, and from what we can now see, he is waiting to see which prison he'll be sent to. It's now 40 years since he drove off with his deceased father's tools. 27 of those years, he spent in solitary confinement either with the absence of the sun or in total darkness. It's eerily quiet on the cell block, and the doors that morning haven't been opened as they usually would be. Suddenly, the inmates hear the thudding of footsteps. It's a shakedown. Some inmates frantically search for the best hiding places to put their contraband. One of the guards shouts to the prisoners with an offer, give us the contraband before we find it and you won't get charged. Yeah right, think most of the men who've spent a few years in prison. There will be no amnesty, or at least in the past some guards didn't make good on their promise. One particular inmate has a lot to fear. As the guards approach his cell, he tries his darndest to fit half a pack of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Chewing Gum into a small wall crevice behind the wash basin. He's in a lot of trouble if they find that stuff. Like most people, you might wonder why prisoners can get in so much trouble for having some harmless chewing gum. In this case, the prisoner, let's just call him Bill after the founder of Wrigley's Gum, had no intention of just chewing that stuff merely for enjoyment's sake. Bill wasn't concerned about his bad breath, and he wasn't a gum chewer because he was suffering from stress or had a bad habit of grinding his teeth. What Bill really wanted to do with that gum was make an impression of a key he thought he could steal and then later return. You see, once you have that impression, you have a good chance of replicating the key. And in prison, you could say keys are the last thing prison staff want prisoners to get their hands on. Another thing gum can be used for is jamming door locks, which could be a huge problem for officers when an inmate is intent on self-harming or causing some serious facial damage to another inmate. Those are the two main reasons that chewing gum in prison is banned. Now let's have a look at some other everyday items that are usually verboten in the penitentiary. Some of them we're sure will come as a surprise to you, well, unless you've been around the prison blocks yourself. 
A lot of prisoners pass the time by sketching or writing diaries, or perhaps writing the next great American crime novel. And while paper is for the most part allowed, one thing prisoners can't have are spiral-bound notebooks. You know, those ones with the rings holding the thing together? You might automatically think that the reason is because the metal rings can be fashioned into weapons. And you'd be right, but there's another reason. That's because if a prisoner has some smarts, he or she might be able to pick a lock with the device made from those rings. The next one, from what we can see, only applies to prisoners in England and Wales. This rule was introduced only in 2013. Some prisoners over there can get through many hours enclosed within those prison walls by watching movies. There's not always good movies on TV, and so the prisoners might have the choice to watch DVDs. Ok, so that's good for them, and if they want, they might even re-watch old prison escape movies such as The Great Escape or The Shawshank Redemption. But there's one kind of DVD they cannot have, and those are movies that have an R rating. You might think that sounds pretty stupid when a lot of those men have actually lived R-rated lives, but back in 2013, the Justice Secretary said he no longer wanted inmates watching violent movies or films that depict too clearly how babies are made. Back to the US and censorship there is also alive and well, but this time we're talking about various books being banned in certain states. Texas has banned 12,000 books in its prisons, with some of those being classics written by the likes of William Shakespeare and the man that penned Big Brother is watching, George Orwell. For a while, in Colorado's prisons, you couldn't even get your hands on Barack Obama's two memoirs because the state said they were potentially detrimental to national security. That decision was later reversed. But a lot of activists in the US still say book banning in prisons on such a wide scale defies logic. One of the most popular books in the US prisons and other prisons around the world is called The 48 Laws of Power. In a doggy dog environment, this could be said to be essential reading. Ask the rapper 50 Cent. It became so popular that a bunch of US prisons have now banned it. Moving on, getting a good night's sleep in prison can be hard because of the noise but also because of the lights. One thing you'd think that the prison commissary would sell is sleep masks. But if they aren't available in the prison store, then technically they are classified as contraband. We found one prisoner whose hustle was making prison masks, but he was in fact breaking the rules. It seems that earplugs are usually available, so at least an inmate can block out the noise. As for the next one, some of you will immediately know why it's considered contraband, while our more innocent viewers may have to think about it. In prison, you're not allowed to store any of your bodily fluids, and that goes for all fluids that can possibly come out of your body. We don't think we need to go into too much detail. It doesn't matter if some prisoners have adopted an alternative health kind of lifestyle and have decided to imbibe their own urine. You just can't keep that stuff. The reason is, some crazed or aggrieved inmates might fashion some kind of squirting device and fire the liquid at the guards. This is something prisoners refer to as gassing. One big pain in the exterior for a lot of prisons is the fact that they're not allowed to take lists into prisons of addresses and telephone numbers. Some prisoners will just have to remember the important numbers and addresses and then write them down on paper they're given. In time, they can get more numbers and addresses from people they call or write to. We found one guy that wrote his numbers down in a Bible he'd been given, but in some prisons you're only allowed a certain kind of Bible, the soft kind. It differs from prison to prison, but in some places you might only be able to order a certain number of books, and those books might have to have softbacks. The reason for this is that those large hardbacks might make a good hiding place for a prison knife, and while hiding a shank in the spine of a Bible might seem immoral, it's been done before. Another reason is that a thousand page encyclopedia with a rigid hardback would hurt a bit if you were hit over the head with it. Sometimes prisoners accidentally find themselves with contraband and that might be because they've been sent some legal paperwork from their attorneys. There have actually been cases of prisoners getting in trouble for having staples and paper clips that were part of a package sent by an attorney. A staple or two might not make a good weapon, but one thing staples are good for is making tattoo needles. As for paper clips, those harmless things, if used correctly, can help a man to get out of his handcuffs. Basically, anything metal and pointy is not allowed in prison, mainly because it can be used to puncture things or unlock things. You should also know that prisoners can't just store lots of certain items. Sure, there are hoarders in prison, but those guys often find themselves on the wrong side of the guards. It could be something as harmless as toilet paper, but if you have enough of that stuff and a lot of time on your hands, you could harden it until it becomes something known as the toilet paper shank. This is also the reason prisoners might not be allowed to have full-length pencils, because they could be used to put a hole in the person. What prisoners are usually given are short pencils, referred to as golf pencils. It depends which prison you're in and what kind of security you at your house den, but often all a prisoner will have to write with is one of those golf pencils. This is a real pain for some prisoners who write a lot, and they've been known to modify them and make them longer. 
Sticking with pencils, if you add enough water to the graphite, you can make something to put on your face. In women's prisons, believe it or not, makeup might be available to buy at the commissary, but that's not always the case. Sometimes women or men who like to wear makeup can use the shells of M&Ms and mix them with water. Once a prisoner has the candy and has the palette, all kinds of colors can be made. While this is hardly the crime of the century, once those candy shells become makeup, they're contraband. As for jewelry in federal prisons in the US, you can wear wedding rings without stones or engravings in them, and you can get away with a necklace if it has a religious medallion connected to it, but any jewelry shouldn't have a value of over $100. People have actually been killed with jewelry, and if it's worth too much, someone might kill you for it. In 2010, in one US prison, an inmate asked another inmate to try on his religious necklace, after which he strangled him with it. In one prison handbook, we found that this was against the rules. Manufacturing of dice, dominoes, chess sets, cards, or any other form of games. Ok, it's against the rules, but it happens. Prison wouldn't be prison if inmates didn't have dice that they had made out of toilet paper, and some prisoners have been known to take the time to create an entire chess set. It's not easy to do, but one prisoner said he had making such things down to a fine art. And he had a template, since when his cell was shaken down, he always lost his instruments for game playing. He said sometimes things need to be stuck together, which wasn't always easy in prison because glue is hard to come by, but there's always an alternative though, since the stickers on shampoo bottles and toothpaste can be used as an adherent. A lot of games are banned simply because they can lead to gambling. Gambling can lead to sore losers and also to prison debt, and in turn, that can lead to fighting and at the very worst, death. It all depends on where you are and who's guarding you, but some staff will turn a blind eye to such activities. If there is a shakedown, well, blind eyes are not usually turned in those circumstances. We found one prisoner who said while incarcerated, he and other inmates would go to great lengths to create the tools needed to play Dungeons and Dragons. In the day room, you'd find an Aryan Brotherhood table and a Mexican Mafia table, and close by, you'd find the Dungeons and Dragons guys. The guard would mostly allow them to play, but he said the problem was when a newer guard would find an elaborate game map that they'd created and automatically think it was an escape route from the prison. When that happened, things turned a little serious. One such occasion, a young guard was about to confiscate the map when an older guard approached him and said, don't worry, that's no escape plan, it's a Dungeons and Dragons map. In response to that, the younger guy just called him a nerd. Ok, so this last one is hardly a household item, unless you include human beings as being items. We found in some prisons when inmates have gotten lonely, they've created, well, how do we say this? They've created a partner, someone to hold and love and cherish during those long, long hours locked up. Homemade lovers are not on the list of allowed items though, and so if you get caught with one, you could find yourself having to explain it to the guards. Prison, the final frontier for some, a place where they end their days. Others will get to leave, but they wish they'd never step foot inside. Here are 50 things nobody tells you about prison. Number 50. We'll start with the USA, the country that can claim to lock more of its citizens up than any other, and by a long way too. According to 2020 data, there were 2.3 million US citizens behind bars. But when we say bars, that includes federal and state prisons, jails, juvenile correctional facilities, and immigration detention facilities. Just so you know, these numbers are not exactly stable, but close. People enter and leave facilities all the time. Number 49. It works out to around 639 people behind bars for every 100,000 people. The US is still number one in per capita terms. Here are the countries that follow up in the top 10. The number is per 100,000. El Salvador 562, Turkmenistan 552, Palau 552, Rwanda 511, Cuba 510, Maldives 449, Virgin Islands UK 447, Thailand 443, the Bahamas 442. Let's stick with numbers for now. We'll get around to the messed up story soon, we promise. Number 48. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, in the US 600,000 people enter prison every year, but that's nothing compared to jail. Around 10.6 million Americans enter jail every year. If you're wondering why that number is so high, it's because many people get out of jail very quickly, once they've got bail. Some of them already have been convicted for small crimes, so stay there for a while. They number around 160,000 people a year. One quarter of people who go to jail will be there again after release within a year. Another reason for staying in jail is the simple fact that many poor people can't afford to make bail. In 2019, the Chicago Tribune wrote that of the 5,736 inmates in Cook County Jail, 5,390 were waiting for a trial. Half of them couldn't afford to pay bail, or they didn't have a place to stay where they could be electronically monitored. That begs the question, how many are innocent? Number 47. 
It's hard to say because statisticians tell us that a person is nine times more likely to say they are guilty of a misdemeanor crime if they can't make bail. They just want to move things on, even if they're innocent. In fact, 95% of cases never go to trial. People take plea bargains, sometimes if they're innocent. That doesn't mean prisons are teeming with innocent people, but quite a few people have been wrongly convicted of a crime. The Innocence Project says it's between 2.3% and 5% of prisoners in the US. Other sources put it as high as 10%. But why? Number 46. The answer is for many reasons. Some innocent people take a plea, especially if they think they have a less than great lawyer and they've been convinced that if the case goes to trial, they're looking at a hefty prison sentence. In court, an innocent person could lose because of prosecutorial misconduct, or because a witness lied, or even a cop lied. Maybe during the interrogation, the police were somewhat heavy-handed and the victim was overwhelmed. Let's now look at an extreme case when this happened. Number 45. We've picked on the US enough for now, so now we'll sail across the pond to the UK. In 1974, a 17-year-old council worker named Stephen Downing confessed to murdering a 32-year-old woman named Wendy Sewell. The case would become known as the greatest miscarriage of justice the UK had ever seen, although that's questionable given witches were burned there. Anyway, this young lad first told cops he found the woman at the cemetery where he was working as a groundskeeper. He said he moved her body and that's why he got blood on him. He was interrogated for nine long hours. He also had learning difficulties, and there wasn't any lawyer with him during the questioning. Guess what, at the end of the grueling interrogation, he'd said he'd done it. He was given a long sentence with the condition that he could meet with a parole board after 10 years. Inmates believed this guy had hurt a woman, so he was beaten badly and he had to change prisons eight times. Later, he was caught in something called the innocent prisoner's dilemma. He couldn't be paroled because he refused to say he committed the crime. Talk about a catch-22. It's actually not that uncommon. We won't get too much into it, but the whole case was shambles. He should have never been sent to prison. The cops knew this. One journalist that tried to help Downing told the BBC that the police harassed him. He said, they made my life absolute hell for five or six years. I was pulled over for speeding, stopped and searched, victimized. I was very worried for my family. Downing got out after 27 years and subsequent investigations found that the police in the past had done some very sketchy work indeed. On release, he received around $1 million in compensation and became a chef. He told the press, I never allowed myself to feel angry or bitter. Who could I have taken it out on anyway? I still refuse to. Number 44. The vast majority of prisoners in the US are not in for violent offenses. We looked at the latest 2021 data from the US Bureau of Prisons and saw that 46.2% of prisoners were in for drug offenses. No other crime came close. Although offenses relating to weapons, explosives, and arson accounted for 20.2% of prisoners. Every 25 seconds, someone is arrested for drug possession in the US, although they don't all end in prison, of course. Number 43. We looked into drug possession offenses and it is a very, very contentious issue. One reason is that drugs are widely available in prisons. In fact, there are reports stating that people have gone in for possessing soft drugs and got addicted to hard drugs inside to deal with the mental issues they faced. The vast majority of prisoners in for drugs are not trafficking drug kingpins, they're merely addicts. Research shows that importers or high-level suppliers only amount to 11% of drug offenders doing hard time. On top of that, there's ample data to suggest that more poor people get stopped by cops and more of them go to prison for drug offenses than middle-class or wealthy people. As the Marshall Project said, rich drug abusers go to treatment, not prison. The UK Guardian echoed that, saying, the wealthy make mistakes, the poor go to jail. The story said, you're much more likely to have a drug problem if you've suffered trauma growing up or grown up poor. Prison is like a double whammy. Pew Research said this, more imprisonment does not reduce state drug problems. Pew discovered that the deterrent of prison hasn't and doesn't stop people from taking drugs. This is why this is one very big hot potato of a subject. Okay, enough of that. Who served the most time ever? Number 42. We found a few names. Paul Geidel served 68 years in the US after being convicted of second-degree murder in 1911. Weird thing is, it's looking like a parole board might have released him in 1926 because of his good behavior, but then he was found to be legally insane. He could have gotten out after 63 years, but by then he was so institutionalized that he chose to stay in another five years. He died a free man in 1987, age 93. Number 41. Francis Clifford Smith served over 71 years in prison for the murder of a night watchman in 1950 in Connecticut. In 2020, he was moved to a nursing home. Now you'll see how innocent men can spend many years behind bars. Number 40. In 1972, age 26, Richard Phillips went to prison an innocent man. He was released 46 years later. 
He wrote this poem a few years into his incarceration. Ain't it a crime when you don't have a dime to buy back the freedom you've lost? Ain't it odd that when you pray to God, your prayers don't seem to be heard? Ain't it sad when you've never had the freedom of a soaring bird? He was finally exonerated in 2018 and later told he received $1.5 million in compensation. He told the media, I just want to keep a low profile, travel, and enjoy life. That's what I've wanted to do in the first place. Number 39. In a paper titled Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it was said that 4% of people in the US on death row are probably innocent in the past and right now. Number 38. 18 people in the US have gotten off death row after DNA testing proved that they were innocent. They had collectively served 229 years. Sometimes innocent people get executed too, as you'll now see. Number 37. A US man named Cameron Todd Willingham was executed in 2004 and later his innocence was proved after the case was said to have been heavily flawed. His last words were, the only statement I want to make is that I am an innocent man, convicted of a crime I did not commit. This is what an investigator later said, the whole case was based on the purest form of junk science. Johnny Garrett was executed in the US in 1992, and later DNA evidence proved he was innocent. It said he didn't want to share any last words, although some sources say he said, I'd like to thank my family for loving me and taking care of me. The rest of the world can kiss my… we omitted one word. When innocent Florida man Jesse DeFerro was executed in 1990, old Sparky malfunctioned, and witnesses said what they saw was pure horror. The South Florida Sun Sentinel wrote, flames and smoke erupted from his head. Now you'll see that executions of innocent people don't only happen in the USA. Number 36. In Russia in 1983, a man named Alexander Kravchenko was executed for murder. Turns out that the killer was none other than the butcher of Rostov, Andrei Chikatilo. In 1950, a man named George Kelly was hanged in the UK for murder. There had been unbelievable police corruption in the case, the cops basically set him up. In fact, police had the confession of another man, but since they'd made a mess of the case, they held that information back. In 1989, a man named Tang Jingxiang was executed in China for the murder of a woman. That woman later turned up to the surprise of everyone. Jingxiang had committed no crime at all. Number 35. Prisoners get drunk while locked up on alcohol they make themselves. It's sometimes called hooch or pruno or prison wine. The best brewers can earn okay money from selling it. One former prisoner said, you can sell half a gallon of wine for 25 bucks. Each pant leg makes two and a half gallons, so you do the math. It's a good hustle. He said he cut pant legs and sewed the bottoms and lined them with plastic bags. Then he filled them with water. After that, he threw in five pounds of sugar, a loaded diced tomatoes, and tomato paste. He then let that all ferment. Other prisoners have used bread for yeast. As for the sweetness, any kind of fruit works, but you can also add candy. It's important to burp the bag. We saw a guy in a podcast who said he'd forgotten to do that, and he got covered in the stuff when it exploded. Number 34. Another thing prisoners will pay good money for is mobile phones. It's not easy getting them in. Sometimes an officer can be tempted with cash or even threatened. Other times the phones are plugged in the rear, which you can imagine can be quite uncomfortable. For a run-of-the-mill phone, you might be able to charge a thousand bucks US inside prison. Number 33. In 2015, Brazilian prison officers discovered a unique way prisoners were getting phones inside. They used cats. One cat that frequently went in and out of the prison was found with four mobile phones, four chargers, and seven cards attached to it. Number 32. Just how much a man can plug is anyone's guess, but we saw a documentary where an officer showed how a prisoner had plugged a foldable knife. The British Prime Minister was recently given a lesson on such acts when he learned some British prisoners were hiding kinder eggs in themselves filled with drugs. Number 31. Why would people go to such an effort, you might ask? The answer is the markup. Drugs in prison are way more expensive than on the outside, so much so officers might sometimes get in on the dealing. It's a license to print money, and there's no shortage of prisoners wanting something to take the monotony away. In fact, because opiates can't be detected in urine around two to three days later, some prisoners get into them even though they just wanted to smoke weed. Weed can be detected up to 21 days after ingestion. One podcast we watched said he took opiates in prison, but every so often he got caught out. He said then he went back to the first floor where he had no privileges. He'd slowly go back to the upper floor where he'd do more opiates, then he got caught again and was sent back down. He called it the merry-go-round. Number 30. Even tobacco is expensive inside. One prisoner said he was getting stuff brought in, and then he charged two or three dollars for just one small rolled cigarette. That meant that one pouch cheap outside of prison was worth a lot of money. In 2020, in an Irish prison, officers discovered one haul that included mobile phones, 800 grams of weed, 2 grams of cocaine, and 10,000 pills. 
To give you an idea of how much that's worth, we'll go to another news story that said in the UK in just 2017, 15,000 phones and a massive 189 kilos of drugs were confiscated. A phone in a UK prison might go for $300 to $1,300, and those are low quality devices. The same article said synthetic drug called Spice can cost over 30 times more in prison than on the outside. Cocaine, depending on the quality, might cost 100 bucks on the outside for a gram. That might go for 1000 on the inside. The markup was even higher for a gram of heroin. This is why some people put eggs in their behind. Number 29. Another way to get stuff in is when violent cons groom officers. That happened to a man named Lee Davies in England. He was on incredibly low pay for such a stressful job, and then he helped some gang members get phones and drugs inside. His money problems were over. He was told to wait in a car park someplace, then a car would pull up and throw something into his car. He then smuggled the package inside, and he kept doing that for months. He was eventually caught. He said later, there's no excuse for what I did, but I have deep sympathy for people working in that environment. He believes he was partly groomed by the prisoners. Number 28. He started on £20,000 a year, or $27,000. That's a very low wage, but the job has got to be one of the hardest you could do. According to job websites, a starting prison officer's wage might be $31,740 a year in the US. Overstressed and underpaid is what you hear from most officers. They're dealing with violence and outrage, and sometimes severe mental issues almost on a daily basis. Number 27. Then there's what's called the prison industrial complex. Mass incarceration has become a business, one that is booming in the US. The American Civil Liberties Union says mandatory minimum sentences helped create the US's bursting prisons, and on top of that, there was the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. This led to more mass incarceration and massive profits for the private prison industry. There are many kinds of businesses that make money, not just private prisons. You have the food services, handcuff makers, clothes services, and the ones earning from cheap prison labor, and much more. This is how one person put it. The prison industrial complex is not only a set of interest groups and institutions, it's a state of mind. The lure of big money is corrupting the nation's criminal justice system, replacing notions of safety and public service with a drive for higher profits. Number 26. These are some companies benefiting or that benefited from cheap prison labor in the US. McDonald's, Walmart, Microsoft, IBM, Target, Intel, Victoria's Secret, yeah, they make lingerie, Honda, Starbucks, Nike, Nintendo. Number 25. If you want to know how much the prisoners make, NPR interviewed a guy that worked at Omaha Correctional Center after getting 8 to 16 years for theft and forgery. He was paid $2.25 a day for a 12-hour shift, but he also said one phone call cost him 5 bucks and a bag of chips also cost him 5 bucks. Number 24. For some regular prison work in some prisons, you get nothing. Just getting out of your cell is payment. Prison policy said in Florida, if you're laboring for state-owned industries, you can earn between 20 cents and 55 cents an hour. That seems to be about the going wage. Now for some more prison violence. Number 23. Not surprisingly, prisoners get killed in prison. Gang violence is usually to blame, or at times people are killed for a certain crime they committed on the outside, or someone just gets killed over an argument. In 2008, there were only 40 homicides in US prisons. That number pretty much increased every year. In 2020, the last data we could find, the number was 120. As you'll now see, violence inside the prison is much worse in other countries. Number 22. We looked at prisons and jails in Ecuador and what's been going on in 2021. In February, the BBC reported that 79 people were murdered in four different Ecuadorian jails, although they were related to the same gang squabbles. In April, the BBC reported five men were murdered and 16 injured in just one Ecuadorian prison, again gang-related. In July, Al Jazeera wrote that 22 men were murdered and many others were injured in two prisons in that country. Gang rivalry was to blame, but overcrowding and bad conditions was also mentioned. After that, Ecuador's president declared a state of emergency. Number 21. Ok, so you've all seen the movies that suggest in some US prisons you have to join a gang or you'll either get beaten or exploited. Really, do convicted accountants end up putting in work for the Sereños? It's actually a complex question, but we guess the best people to answer it are folks who've done a lot of prison time. There's no shortage of those people, who now have their own YouTube channel. People say it depends on where you're doing your time, but it might not mean you have to get involved with a gang. Most prisoners give the advice, just keep your head down and do your time. They usually agree on one thing though, and that is you will likely at least need alliances. A British stockbroker agreed. He had the bad idea of starting an ecstasy empire after moving to the US. After being locked up in Arizona, he said the first thing that happened scared the hell out of him. Gang members came into his cell and asked for his papers. He didn't know what that meant. 
They actually wanted to see what he'd been convicted of to make sure he hadn't hurt society's most vulnerable. In some prisons, that could mean KOS, or kill on sight. It's why some prisoners are housed in protective custody. After he was deemed okay, he said he didn't join a gang, but he also said he made some friends. That made his life much, much easier. One former prisoner in the US said this, The commonly held belief that joining a gang is the only way to survive prison is one that I sincerely wish would forever go the way of the dodo. I honestly think it's the gangs themselves that try their hardest to propagate this false notion. Another guy agreed, but he said hanging with your own race in some prisons is a must. He also said this, In the yard all the races hang with their own. With the gangs and shot callers, they may take advantage of the weaker ones, making them pay rent and such, but once you stand up for yourself they'll usually stop and often ask you to join the gang. If you say no, they usually accept it. So no, you won't have to join a gang, but as you'll now see, you also won't be completely independent. Number 20. There's the dining room or chow hall. If you don't get told where to sit by officers, you'll sit with your own race. This is where it helps to have made friends. You certainly have to show respect, so just plonking your behind down without thinking about it will lead to you getting a bust head. One prisoner said at his prison there was what he called short bus tables. These were the tables where anyone could sit, but he said they were reserved for the less respected prisoners. Most former prisoners agree on one thing. It's in the chow hall where you see alliances. Even if you're a fiercely independent person, some former prisoners say going it alone is not recommended. Number 19. In the UK, race doesn't matter all that much. You usually hook up with friends, and if you're a longtime criminal, you'll likely have some. If there are gang rivalries, it's not about the color of your skin, but where you come from. In London or Liverpool, there have been what the media called postcode wars. In some podcasts, former British prisoners from the south said they didn't like getting sent to the northern part of the country and vice versa. Number 18. If you do get attacked in prison, it's sometimes with a homemade knife or shiv. Sometimes it's just with a razor blade. Other times the instrument will have a few razor blades attached close to each other. This is so the wound is almost impossible to stitch. The British media has reported a lot on this. Apparently the wound leaves a really big scar. That's bad. But this is worse. Number 17. One of the most horrendous things prisoners do, and it seems it's not all that uncommon, is throw boiling water in someone's face. They'll usually fill the water with sugar because that makes the water caramelized and sticky. In the past, in the UK, this has been referred to as napalm. After that, you need some good advice. Number 16. Prisoners often talk about the prison code, which to be frank sounds hypocritical and nonsensical a lot of the time. Still, there are some do's and don'ts the prisoners talk about. Do. Keep your head down. Be polite and respectful as much as possible. If you're picked on or attacked, fight back even if you're the lamest fighter in the world. Develop an exercise routine. Study the lay of the land. Educate yourself when something is available. Choose your friends carefully. Maintain good personal hygiene. Don't. Act tough. Now you're nobody. Gamble. Take drugs. Borrow stuff, even if someone seems really kind. Judge people. Steal. Stare. Talk to everyone about your crime. Fart, if you can help it. Snitch. Number 15. Sometimes inmates locked in their cells create what are called biological projectile weapons. These are to spray officers with urine, feces, or even bile. Just in California, at three prisons, there were 111 gassing attacks in 2017. In that state, you get five years in segregation for gassing an officer. Number 14. Prisoners sometimes use coded letters to get messages to each other, which might look innocuous, but if you can decode the message, something darker lurks between the words. In 2018, a letter sent from a prisoner to the outside that didn't take anything out of the ordinary was an order to kill a staff member in the Atlanta jail. You just had to read between the lines. Other times, prisoners create their own ciphers, with symbols designating a letter of the alphabet. A gang expert who specializes in breaking codes said about this, Not knowing what a code says can give us nightmares. We need to know what these gang codes say, but sometimes we need to know what they don't say even more. Number 13. Perhaps one of the strangest things to happen in a woman's prison is someone gets pregnant when they have never had a conjugal visit, like a private visit with a lover or spouse. That happened in 2019. A woman had been behind bars for a year and a half, waiting to be sentenced for capital murder when she had a baby. She'd been charged with being the getaway driver when an elderly man was shot and killed. It later transpired that she'd somehow conspired to get pregnant by sleeping with a male inmate working at the prison. News reports said she hoped to having a new child would sway the judge to grant her some leniency. This next one is heartbreaking. Number 12. The youngest prisoner ever to sit on death row was George Julius Stinney Jr. This African-American boy was arrested in June 1944, charged with killing two people. In June, he was executed in the electric chair, and he was so small that a Bible had to be propped under him on the chair. 
The investigation was an absolute travesty of justice, and the jury that sentenced him was all white. The grave he was buried in was unmarked. In 2014, the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project said this, There is compelling evidence that George Stinney was innocent of the crimes for which he was executed in 1944. There wasn't any substantial evidence to support his guilt, and his defense lawyer was less than useless. In fact, he had no support at all. It was a kid against the racist cops and indeed the racist justice system. The real murderer of Betty June Binnaker and Mary Emma Thames got away. His conviction was overturned in 2014. Number 11. The oldest person executed was Walter Moody. He died by lethal injection in Alabama in 2018. He'd been convicted of killing a judge with a mail bomb in 1989. Number 10. Prison is supposed to rehabilitate, that's why it's there. But often those that go in, go in again. Officers sometimes call the prison gates a revolving door. It's hard to compare recidivism rates worldwide because you have to choose certain years to conduct the study, and there's a lot of data from all over the world. The US National Institutes of Health did a study, but the data was from different years regarding different countries. Nonetheless, it found that the percentage of released prisoners that were arrested for another crime within two years in England and Wales was 48%. In France, it was 40%. In Finland, it was 36%. In Norway, it was 20%. In Australia, it was 53%. And in the US, it was 60%. Number 9. The US Supreme Court in 2011 called California's recidivism rates stratospherically high. It was said then that a whopping 70% of released prisoners in that state were back behind bars within three years. The state's prisons were accused of not rehabilitating but producing additional criminal behavior. That's why prisons are sometimes called crime school. It's hard to fully understand why people end up back in prison, but parole violations and habitual drug use, as well as falling back into poverty and hopelessness, count for something. Critics have said US and other countries' prisons focus a lot more on punishment rather than rehab, which is the opposite of the Norwegian model. As you know, that country has very low recidivism rates. Ok, we think you need to hear some good news. Well, it's kinda positive. Number 8. A British guy named Stephen Akpabio Klementowski was locked up in England in 2002. While serving his 16-year sentence for drugs offenses, he earned a bachelor's degree and two master's degrees. He had zero qualifications when he went in and started with his GCSEs and A-levels. That's equivalent to junior and senior high school. He worked in the kitchens all day and studied on the toilet at night, where he said it was quiet. He told the Guardian, sometimes I wondered how I did it. The idea that you can study in an environment designed for punishment is ridiculous. He said it wasn't easy studying in what he described as a hellish place. I still have nightmares 10 years after leaving. It's a really damaging environment, he said. He's now a lecturer and a regional manager and spends a lot of time going back into prisons to help prisoners. While he did well locked up, he's still very critical of British justice. He doesn't believe prison acts as a deterrent to crime. He said people aren't being deterred. The number of people in prison has increased by 69% over the last 30 years. They're not being rehabilitated. Number 7. Anthony Ray Hinton spent close to three decades in isolation on death row in Alabama. He was exonerated in 2015. He's since written an award-winning book, The Sun Does Shine, How I Found Life and Freedom on Death Row, and was awarded an honorary degree. Now you'll hear about a man who's more locked up than anyone else. Number 6. The British man who spent the longest time in prison is Robert Maudsley. He's been locked away since 1974, but for the last 25 years, he's been in the worst prison cell in the whole of England. He killed three men while in prison and one of those murders earned him the name the British Hannibal to Cannibal. It was a brutal murder, but not as bad as those British tabloids made it out to be. Now he's in a special cell which is underneath the prison. It has thick doors with bulletproof glass. Even when you open the doors, he's actually in a cage within the cell. He's allowed no contact at all with other prisoners. He gets out once a day for an hour, but has to have six guards around him at all times. They try not to make eye contact with him or speak to him. He once said, I am left to stagnate, vegetate and to regress, left to confront my solitary head on with people who have eyes but don't see, and who have ears but don't hear, who have mouths but don't speak. Many people have called this inhumane. They know his story and feel sorry for him given his childhood and the nature of the offenses of the people he killed. We won't go into detail, but we think you can work it out. He's possibly the most locked up man in the world. He once said, I feel like I'm buried alive. The prison wouldn't even allow him to have a pet budgie. Number 5. The polar opposite of this is Bolivia's San Pedro prison. It's more like a village than a prison. There are cells to rent, markets to shop in, and even tourists can visit. Prisoners make cash by selling cocaine paste to them. 
Wives and children can live with the prisoner. There's also a prison hotel, a soccer pitch, a few churches, and a hospital. Officers work there, but the prisoners themselves ensure bad things don't happen inside. If a prisoner does commit a crime, they are disciplined in, let's say, a very stern way. If they commit a very serious violent crime, they are likely dead soon after. Number 4. We think the biggest prison in the world has to be Turkey's Silivri Prison. It spans over 250 acres and is home to more than 10,000 prisoners. Are Turkish prisons bad? Maybe they were in the 70s when hundreds of US citizens occupied them, mostly for smuggling that quality hashish they so loved. When Billy Hayes was a student, he was sent to one. He wrote a book on his release and it became the harrowing movie Midnight Express. He actually escaped in the end. He actually said the movie exaggerated a fair few things. The next country's prisons are bad, and no one denies it. Number 3. One prison with lots of Westerners serving hard time within its walls is Bangkok's Klong Prim Prison. Many smugglers have lived there and felt what it's like to sleep with 60-odd men in a cell packed like sardines. One man actually holds a record there to this day. He's a British guy named David McMillan, a former big-time drug smuggler with a rather posh accent. He's the only Westerner ever to have escaped the prison. In prisons such as this, if you have money, you can live well. There's a kind of anarchy in there and the guards take a piece of everything. Macmillan had a personal cook, someone to do his laundry, and he had a cell with few people in it that had a TV. He even had a little office area. But when he heard he would be transferred to Bangkwang Central Prison, aka the Bangkok Hilton, he made a plan to escape. The Thais call this prison the Big Tiger because it eats men. Many that go in die there. Macmillan successfully escaped, but the funny part is that once he got to the street, he opened an umbrella he'd taken with him. When asked why he did that, he said, escaping prisoners don't carry umbrellas. Number 2. One of the worst prison disasters we could find happened in the US at Ohio State Prison in 1930. There was a huge fire, except the guards wouldn't open the cell doors. One person described it like this. There was nothing to do but scream for God to open the doors. And when the doors didn't open, all that was left was to stand still and let the fire burn the meat off and hope it wouldn't be too long about it. Some prisoners managed to overpower the guards, but outside those cells they were given orders to shoot and kill. One prisoner later said, naturally all of those men were in there and hollering and screaming for help and some of the men were praying and some of them was cussing and some of them were raving. It was a question to do what you could do to help them. 322 inmates died from the fire or smoke inhalation and another 230 had to be hospitalized. Ok, let's finish on a positive note. Number 1. There's a prison in Finland called Suomenlinna Prison. The prison walls are actually just a small fence. In the past it has had problems with prisoners not trying to break out, but people trying to sneak in. The cells are like nice dorm rooms, and the shared kitchens all have the modern appliances you can ask for. Some prisoners are in there for the most serious offenses, but they go to this prison when their term is close to an end. It's kind of like finishing school, the halfway house before prisoners enter society at large. Still, they do their last few years there even though they could easily just walk out. Why might you wonder? A prison official said this, the main idea here is to prepare the inmates for release into the community. It doesn't make sense for an inmate to be in a closed prison for say 6 years and to suddenly enter civilian life. We also offer rehabilitation for people who have had problems related to alcohol, drugs or mental illness. Alcatraz Island, where the notorious prison was based, is located about one and a quarter miles off San Francisco Bay. It started as a home to a lighthouse, became a military base and then a military prison in the 19th century, before becoming the location of one of America's most talked about lockups in 1934 that lasted until 1963. This small island measuring just 1675 feet by 590 feet is still home to a prison today, but only as a kind of somber museum. Known as The Rock, it housed some of the US's most dangerous criminals. It was said no one could ever escape this island, but history tells us two men may have, or they may have died in the water. Many others have tried and failed. Al Capone when it comes to names associated with the Italian Mafia, perhaps Al Capone is the name most people remember. You may have seen him depicted in numerous movies and TV shows, and if you have, you'll know he seemed to have a very light and very dark side. He robbed from the rich and sometimes gave to the poor. He also killed and ordered killed many people. It seems he had a very fiery temper at times. He was also behind the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and after this he became more of a reviled figure. 
He was first jailed in 1929 for carrying deadly weapons, but the sentence was a short one. But in 1931, he was charged with tax evasion and prohibition charges, and after a stint in jail, he ended up in Alcatraz. He was released in 1939, but in the ensuing years, he suffered many health problems due to complications of syphilis. He lost his mind and died in 1947. James Whitey Bulger from Italian-American gangster to an Irish-American gangster, and someone who again had been depicted in films and TV shows, not surprisingly, he too was said to have a very short temper and sometimes a lust for blood. He ruled with an iron fist, but was also an FBI informant. For this, well, likely for this, he was beaten to death as an old man while in prison in 2018. Was he dangerous? Very much so. And while he was only charged with 11 murders, there are those that say he killed and ordered killed scores of people. He was imprisoned in Alcatraz many years before his downfall, in 1959. He had served time in an Atlanta prison before that. That was for old school type bank robberies, and he got 20 years. That sentence was reduced when it was discovered that he had taken part in the not so ethical MKUltra LSD trials. It said he read classics and mostly kept his head down, but escape was never far away in his mind. He was one of the friends of the men that maybe did escape, and he believed all his life that they got away. He once wrote, the morning of the escape was one of the happiest moments of my life. I can still remember it as if it were yesterday. One month after their escape, he left the island and served another three years in another prison and was released in 1965. He would go on to become a much more prolific and vicious criminal. And in the 90s, one of the biggest manhunts ever was conducted in his name. He evaded arrest for 16 years, and you know what happened to him in his aging years while in prison. Robert Stroud you might better know this man as the Birdman of Alcatraz. While US authorities called him one of the most dangerous men in the USA, he was hardly as bloodthirsty as the first two guys we've talked about. He was, however, a career criminal and was diagnosed as a psychopath. He also assaulted fellow prisoners while incarcerated, prison staff, and one time stabbed a prison guard right through the heart with a homemade shift. The guard died and the authorities had had enough of this violent prisoner. In 1942, he was transferred to Alcatraz, and he would spend at least six years of his time in solitary. He died at a medical center while still serving a sentence. They called him the Birdman as he had cared for and raised birds while serving time in prison. Does he deserve to be on this list? Yes, of course, just for the number of people he hurt while in prison. Machine Gun Kelly No, that's not the name his parents gave him when he was born. This man was christened George Kelly, and as an adult, he became one of the most feared men in America. You can probably guess by his moniker that he had a fondness for using a machine gun, and the FBI once called him an expert machine gunner. His weapon of choice was a Thompson submachine gun. You've all seen one of these things in old gangster movies. It's the gun with a large circular cartridge. In Alcatraz, he was said to be a model prisoner despite what the public thought about him. He was prisoner 117 and spent 17 years at The Rock. He was transferred off Alcatraz in 1951, but died of a heart attack in 1954 while still in prison. He committed many robberies throughout his career, as well as kidnapping, and he had a lot of standoffs with authorities. He was never actually charged with murder, though it's believed he may have committed a few. The FBI seemed to think so. Morton Sobel this former engineer was by no means a cold-hearted killer. However, he was accused by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover of committing the crime of the century. What did he do? Well, it's said he was part of a small group that spied on the US and supplied the Soviet Union with information pertaining to nuclear technology and other military advances in the US. Many said he was innocent, but he was still sentenced to 30 years in 1951 on charges of espionage. He served almost 18 years in total. He stayed in Alcatraz until it closed in 1963 and was said to be a model prisoner. In his 1974 book, On Doing Time, he maintained his innocence, saying his crime had been cooked up for political purposes. In Alcatraz, he even got a room with the view of the Golden Gate Bridge and spent most of his time reading books. Some sources say he got along with fellow prisoners, being a mild man and also for the fact that he was considered an enemy of the state. Did he really supply the Soviets with information that could have been extremely dangerous to the USA? That's for you to investigate. Alvin Creepy Carpus 
This gangster in the time of the American Depression got his nickname not because of what he did, but the fact that his friends and associates thought he had a very sinister smile. He gained the accolade of being one of four America's public enemy number ones during the 1930s when he led the Baker Carpus Gang. An interesting fact is that he was the only survivor of so-called public enemy number ones as the rest were all killed before they could be in prison. Can you guess who the other three were? They were John Dillinger, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Babyface Nelson. Carpus also held the number one position for the person that spent the most time in Alcatraz, serving 26 years in total. His crimes were many and included robbery, kidnapping, burglary, and murder. It's also said he was incredibly intelligent. He helped Charles Manson learn guitar while serving time in another prison, once describing Manson as a man with a pleasant voice and a pleasing personality, although he's unusually meek and mild for a convict. He never has a harsh word to say and is never involved in even an argument. He went on to write a book after he was released and it's said that he may have committed suicide while he was writing another book while living in Spain. Others say he more likely accidentally overdosed. Henri Young This is another case of a man being dangerous not only for what he did on the outside but for what he did while serving time. Mr. Young was a convicted bank robber who was said to have taken hostages and not always been very nice to them. He spent time in various prisons but ended up in Alcatraz in the 1930s. In 1939, he and four others tried to escape, which ended with two of the men surrendering, two running, one shot and killed, and Young also giving himself up. It's said while in Alcatraz he was treated very harshly, spending many years in a small cell all alone. After one stint in solitary, he murdered one of the men he had tried to escape with. His defense said the brutal way he had been treated was partly to blame for the murder. He described what solitary was like, saying, You have no shoes, no bed, no mattress, nothing but the four damp walls and two blankets. The walls are painted black. Once a day, I got three slices of bread. No, that's an error. Some days, I got four slices. He also said there was no way you could have a bath. He was finally released from another prison in 1972. He jumped parole and was never seen again. John and Clarence Anglin Okay, so these two may not have been that dangerous, but we can't finish the show without talking about them. Why is that? Because these are the guys that supposedly escaped from Alcatraz. The brothers did this along with a third man, Frank Morris. It was a long and meticulous build-up to the escape, with the men taking months to fashion tools that would help them escape through shafts and get out of prison. This took a lot of effort, with the men concealing those tools cleverly and knowing how to hide noise when they were making things. They even stole human hair from the barbershop so that the dummies they left in their beds would look real. For their heads, they used soap that they had stolen and then made to look like a face. But they needed to cross the water, and to do that they built an inflatable raft made partly from stolen raincoats. All were career criminals before their incarceration, with Morris imprisoned for many crimes mostly related to stealing things. It's also said that he had a very high IQ for a prisoner at 133. The brothers were both bank robbers, but reports say they did their stealing when people were not around, as they never wanted to hurt anyone. They also said that if people were around, they used to only take a toy gun. Nonetheless, they were successful and robbed many big banks, as they were kind of nice guy criminals. Much of the public, when hearing about their escape, are happy they got away. The authorities would like to think all the men died, but there are many people that think they beat the system and found their freedom. Whatever you think, their story has gone down in history. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. If you saw part one of the show, you'll have heard those words. They were spoken by a doctor who entered a prison in the USA loaded with chemicals to test on humans. Imagine that. You've been punished our serving time, and then you're punished again because someone has been given the green light to use your skin as a testing surface. Much of the time when such prisoners are used in testing, they agree to do it. But often in the past, what they weren't told is exactly what was being tested and the possible dangers involved. Let's now have a look at how this was done. It's ancient history. We're going to start with a man that's sometimes called the father of anatomy. That's a compliment, of course, but his ways could have been said to have been rather unethical. We're talking about a Greek physician called Herophilus of Chalcedon. 
We are told that this physician did occasionally use dead people for his work in understanding the human anatomy, but that didn't always happen. The website ResearchGate tells us that in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt, looking under the hood of dead folks was plain taboo, but this physician did do it and educated Greece on anatomy like no one had done before. But he also performed what are called live vivisections, which basically means opening up a person while they're well and truly aware of it. A Greek encyclopedist known as Celsus wrote in a 2nd century medical book that Herophilus used around 600 live prisoners for his research. His work was groundbreaking as we said, and he was a gift to medical science. But as one scientific paper asks, was he a butcher or an innovator? In this paper, Celsus is quoted as saying, Herophilus and Erasistatrus did this in the best way by far. When they laid open men whilst alive, criminals received out of prison from the kings, and whilst these were still breathing, observed parts which beforehand nature had concealed. According to that thesis, this was a kind of execution, but still one that many people at the time thought was very cruel. No kidding. Radiation Experiments If you read the book The Plutonium Files, you can find many, many examples of when the USA tested dangerous levels of plutonium on American citizens. The US and other countries were trying to develop the atomic bomb, and no one was exactly sure what high levels of radiation would do to a person. Some of these people were patients in hospitals, and some were prisoners. Sometimes they were just sick children, and on one occasion, pregnant women were chosen. In Massachusetts, it's said that 57 kids, many who were mentally retarded, were given oatmeal poisoned with radioactive tracers, and that was conducted by MIT and sponsored by the Quaker Oats Company. This was well after the development of the atomic bomb, and it was all about proving the nutrients in the oatmeal. It sounds like fake news, but it's not. The Smithsonian wrote that these boys were already maltreated and so seen as kids that didn't matter, adding, as part of the study, the boys were fed oatmeal and milk laced with radioactive iron and calcium. In another experiment, scientists directly injected the boys with radioactive calcium. These kids weren't exactly prisoners, but they were in the care of the authorities and didn't have any say in the matter. That same article mentions a few instances when mentally handicapped kids, kids in institutions, institutions, minorities, were tested on and given all kinds of ailments. Back to radiation. In all, you can read about hundreds, maybe thousands of people that were made very sick as American scientists tried to figure out how the body dealt with radiation. All these experiments remained top secret until the 90s, when President Bill Clinton said, it's time we talked about radiation experiment cover-ups. The Plague in the Philippines during the Second World War, the Japanese were trying to figure out how to drop diseases on the USA. But before this time, the US was trying to figure out how to treat major diseases. It said that while in the Philippines, the US Army along with scientists purposely gave five prisoners the bubonic plague and caused something called beriberi in another 29 prisoners. Four of these people died. According to the book, When Doctors Kill, Who, Why, and How, they did this not to try and spread disease, but just to better understand it. That book also says that one particular Harvard professor over there gave other Filipino prisoners cholera. The book says all became very sick and 13 people died. Thankfully, these experiments were investigated and they were called highly unethical. In the book, it's also written that during the Nuremberg trials, Nazi doctors who had done a lot of awful stuff themselves tried to justify their work by using the American scientists in the Philippines as an example of similar malpractice. Torture we should say here that we haven't purposefully picked out the USA, and no doubt awful experiments have been done elsewhere. It's just that there's a lot of literature available on what the USA has done. We can take torture for example, and as you probably know, many prisoners in the US have been given mind-altering drugs that has had very negative consequences. One of the most famous experiments was at Holmesburg Prison, and it took place with 320 inmates from 1964 to 1968. This is the same prison where that doctor talked about acres of skin. Prisoners there were also subjects for radiation experiments. But the torture experiment we're talking about involved incredibly powerful hallucinogens. The scientists wanted to know how much they could give a person so they were completely useless. They tested hundreds of people. One person later said of this prison that had become well known for human guinea pigs. He had a dozen or two experiments going on at one time. He turned Holmesburg into the Kmart of human experimentation. It was a real industry. He was talking about the head doctor there. The doctor later told the press that he did everything according to what was asked of him and followed protocol. 
Even before the place became a giant lab, it was terrible. In 1938, a bunch of prisoners on hunger strike were sent to what were called bake ovens for punishment. It said four prisoners roasted to death. But you don't have to go that far back to see how prisoners have been used so the CIA could figure out the effects of torture. When the CIA just a few years back had prisoners holed up at black sites, it wasn't just torturing people to get information. According to a paper written by the Physicians for Human Rights, waterboarding and sleep deprivation and all manner of other tortures were merely tested on prisoners to see how they might best work. How else would they know? They needed living, breathing subjects, and human rights didn't seem to be an issue. Companies were brought in to what the report says was to calibrate the level of pain experienced by detainees during interrogation. The CIA denied this and the government didn't investigate the matter. Then in 2010, the authorities wanted to know just how effective its active denial system was. This is a powerful laser that can hit a person's body, say people in a riot or a protest, and heat them up. It was first made, though, for war. It was decided that prisoners at Pitch's Detention Center in Los Angeles could be the guinea pigs for the laser. The ray is said to cause intense heat and pain, but when taken off the body, everything goes back to normal. It's also said, though, that there's potential for death and there might even be some terrible long-term effects, such as eye damage if it gets you there, or even more of a chance of developing cancer. We should add that while this prison took the laser as an experimental trial, it did that to use on people only if they got out of hand. Mutants Welcome Dr. Carl Heller. This man's experiments were said by one person to have a bit of the Buchenwald touch, meaning they were not unlike some of the Nazi experiments on humans in concentration camps, but this happened in the US. According to Gizmodo, he did the experiments on behalf of the Atomic Energy Commission. He basically radiated the prisoners, but to the extreme. Yeah, that's right, and he told these prisoners from Oregon and Washington that he had to sterilize them after the radiation so they would not contaminate the world with kids. But what he really said was that he was preventing them from passing on what he called radiation-induced mutants. He did in fact sterilize them, but a few of those guys later sued the government. The experiments went on from 1963 to 1973, and each got around $5 for losing the ability to make children, and also got blasted with radiation. There were other similar experiments performed on mostly poor black people, but they were often people suffering from cancer, so not prisoners. What would happen is they would sign up for a trial in which doctors said they were testing radiation and it might cure them of their cancer. This was a lie. What was actually happening is the US government was trying to see what happens to the body when hit by extremely high levels of radiation, far higher than anyone would receive now from radiation therapy. Cow blood. The rejection of the blood was catastrophic. This is what one scientific paper says about this particular study, in which 64 Massachusetts prisoners were injected with cow blood in 1942 after the US Navy had asked for it. Why oh why, you might be thinking right now. Well, all in the name of science. The same as when 400 inmates at Stateville Correctional Center in Illinois were injected with malaria, and the same year 200 female prisoners were given viral hepatitis, or prisoners injected with cancer cells without their consent in the 50s by the renowned oncologist Chester Milton Southam, or as one book says, the long list of prisoners given potentially fatal diseases in the USA in those days. As for the cow's blood, we're told that a Harvard University scientist was asked by the Navy to create a powerful biological weapon. Well, once source says this, but another says it was to purify the process of extracting album from blood plasma in order to make better drugs. It's actually quite hard to find information about this, but some sources say the catastrophic events we mentioned ended with the death of 64 prisoners. We found another paper that said this, two prisoners at the Norfolk County Jail died of serum sickness induced by the infusions of crystalline bovine albumin. Harvard medical students were admitted to the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital and bled until they went into shock. Whatever the case, everyone agrees on catastrophic. If we extended this show to include more experiments performed on minorities, poor kids, mentally handicapped kids, sick people, pregnant women, mentally ill people, we could have gone on and on. Day of the Escape He takes a pencil from behind his ear and underlines a passage in his prison issue Bible, Genesis 9, 5 through 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. He doesn't yet know it, but these words are going to come back to haunt him. All he's known in his life is violence, from being a young victim to adult perpetrator. He's killed and he'll kill again if anyone tries to get in the way of his escape. He and his accomplice, a man no stranger to extreme violence himself, will do something that's unheard of in the annals of American incarceration. 
Shawshank Redemption has nothing on these guys. Tomorrow, June 6, 2015, at 5.17 a.m., both of these men will be discovered missing from their cells at New York State's Clinton Correctional Facility. This is a huge complex of sprawling buildings first opened in the mid-1800s that once served as a notorious insane asylum. Among the criminal fraternity, it's sometimes called Little Siberia, due to the freezing winters and the fact it's surrounded by miles and miles of rugged wilderness. A good place to get lost if you're a criminal, but a harsh place to try to survive. The authorities will find a cheeky note left for them, a slap in the face if there ever was one. Down the tunnel, another note reads, you left me no choice but to grow old and die in here. I had to do something. On a picture of Tony Soprano that the escapee has painted himself, he's written, time to go, kid, 6 5 15. No one was supposed to be able to escape from this maximum security fortress. No one ever has escaped. The authorities can't believe what they're seeing. They now know that they've underestimated these two uneducated felons, cold-hearted killers as cunning and vengeful as Greek gods. Millions of dollars will be spent trying to catch them, but suffice to say they ain't intending to live behind bars again. They're armed and dangerous and they're heading to the border. Their names are David Sweat and Richard Matt, and this is the story of their truly outstanding escape. This is how it all starts. Day 1. Matt and Sweat have just started working together in one of the prison tailor workshops. Around 400 guys in Clinton make inmate clothes and other tailored stuff, such as lab coats and sweatshirts. They get 25 to 50 cents an hour. It's not much, but the job passes the time. Matt is known throughout the prison as Hacksaw. He's both respected and feared. Feared because of the fact that he got his nickname from dismembering a man. Respected because he'd do it again, but warn you first. Weeks 1 through 6. Outside of crime, these two men have another skill, the art of flirtation. And as luck would have it, the object of their flirtation is a civilian female supervisor who loves the attention of the men she supervises. Her name is Joyce Tilly Mitchell. She isn't exactly easy on the eye and she knows it, which makes her vulnerable to all the guys she's supposed to watch over. On top of this, her relationship with her husband lacks any sort of passion. He's Lyle, and he's a bright star in the story of lies and deception. He's a good person, in a tale full of bad people. He'll get a hit put on his head from a place that he least expects. When Sweat and Matt flirt with Mitchell, she can't help but giggle and blush. The first to really go after her is Sweat, who occasionally flashes naughty winks and smiles at her as he's sewing his clothes together on his machine. It should be said that Mitchell has been accused before of improper conduct with inmates, including Sweat, but as you'll see, she's really good at getting away with things. This is why she's fine with flirting with Sweat again, only this time she'll take things much further. Sweat has the instructor's job and Matt a regular machinist's job. Good friends, their machines are side by side. All day they plan and conspire and stare over at Mitchell. Both these guys have been designated as a central monitoring case, meaning great care should be taken to watch them. Sweat falls into this category just because of the sheer brutality of his crime. The reason Matt is monitored is that he's an escape risk as well as a brute. He's escaped from another prison in the past. A document relating to him reads, All necessary precautions should be taken whenever it's required to move the inmate outside the facility regardless of the reason. So despite having some very sketchy backgrounds and not having great prison records, they are allowed to work in the tailor shop. Lately, they've had quite a good run in terms of staying out of trouble, so both have a cell on what's called the honor block. Here, there are 180 prisoners and 174 cells. Security is just the same here, or should be, but the inmates are at least allowed to wear some civilian clothes, have much more time to hang out with other inmates in the recreational areas, as well as getting a bunch of other privileges. This will all help Sweat and Matt. Sweat's described by another inmate as being very, very self-sufficient in all ways. He's clever and he's resourceful. He's even a bit of a survivalist. Matt is the chatty one, described as sociable and gregarious. He's also tough and can back up his fierce reputation if need be. He's a survivor but far from being a survivalist. He's in his late 40s and Sweat's in his early 30s. It's Matt who introduces Sweat to one of the wonders of painting, a hobby they'll both employ as a means to escape, and one in which Matt shows considerable talent. Weeks 12 through 17. It's now plain to see for the other inmates in the workshop that Sweat and Mitchell have got something going on. It becomes more obvious when, after a while, she starts going to the stock room with him. Mitchell comes out looking all flustered and red in the cheeks. The inmates know exactly what's going on, but one of the guards in the workshop is more interested in reading his book than watching out for inmate-supervisor relationships. Weeks 18 to 25. She gets reported for treating the inmates like friends and being way too close to some of them. Mitchell fires back, complaining that she feels she's being harassed for no reason. She then files a grievance, and to be honest, the prison doesn't want the hassle so she keeps up her job. Let's now introduce another main character to the story. He's correction officer Eugene Palmer, a man who's been at Clinton for 27 years. 
He's the go-to guard for inmates when they have a problem, and he and Matt are described as being two peas in a pod. They've been close, too close, for years now. If Sweat's working on Mitchell during the day, then Matt has Palmer in the palm of his hand on the honor block. It's ideal for the pair. It makes life easy, but at the start, they don't realize it also provides a means to escape. Matt often gives his paintings to Palmer, who's impressed with the artwork. He's especially impressed when Matt gives him paintings and sketches of his own family and house, which he does on a few occasions over the years, and he works really hard at completing them. The better the work, the more favors come Matt's way. When Palmer starts dating Clinton Correctional Officer Mary Lamar, he even commissions Matt to do a bunch of paintings of Lamar's family. One day, she starts crying outside Matt's cell when he gives her the finished piece. She can't believe how amazing it is. Palmer is made up. He's made this woman happy and he owes Matt big time. Matt also informs Palmer when violence is about to happen. One day, they both walk into a quiet corner and Matt warns, you're going to lose your prison. It's a powder keg. It's about to explode. My informant tells me that when it goes, they're going to show no mercy. For this, both Matt and Sweat enjoy the best conditions in the block, receiving TVs from Palmer and as many painting supplies as they want, in spite of the fact that a paintbrush can be used for all kinds of wicked purposes. But more importantly, when Palmer escorts these guys back to the block from the workshop, he sometimes takes them away in which they don't have to pass through any metal detectors. This is foolhardy, to say the least, especially when you find out what kinds of things Mitchell is giving them in the workshop. Weeks 26 through 29 Things are about to change. The prison authorities receive an anonymous letter. It states, Sweat and the workshop supervisor Mitchell are having inappropriate relations, and it's damn obvious to everyone. In the storeroom, says the letter, the two bang like beavers. The complaint even says that Mitchell is always doing favors for the white guys, but she's always on the backs of Latinos and blacks. Further down, the letter states, it's funny that she goes to the next door with the same guy once or twice a week for three to five minutes and comes out with nothing. I've noticed that since I started working here in the past five months. In short, Mitchell is furious and denies everything, but in the end, Sweat gets 30 days in the punishment block without privileges and is taken out of the workshop for security concerns. That's when he's told he'll be moving into a cell away from his buddy Matt. He loses his place on the honor block and now has no way of making money. This will play a big part in his wanting to escape. Mitchell's outrage and the tsunami of complaints she sends to the warden go a long way to help keeping her job. The prison doesn't dare bring charges against her knowing that she'll kick up a stink about harassing a female. But she's more upset about losing the love of her life. She even cries in front of some of the other inmates. She's lost the man she believes really understands her, cares for her, and she's also lost the best damn machinist she's ever had. Suffice to say, things go really downhill in the workshop after Sweat is gone. Weeks 30 to 51. Matt asks Palmer to help make him the workshop supervisor, and Palmer does it. Now, Mitchell's special little helper is Sweat's best friend, and if any other inmates complain, he'll get them thrown out of the workshop. She's also quite attracted to Matt, who, it has to be said, has a way with women. He makes me feel special, Mitchell secretly tells one of her friends. He just understands me. I still haven't gotten over David, but there's just something about Richard. I don't know. He just listens. Matt is by far the better manipulator, even if it's Sweat that has a high IQ. In no time at all, Mitchell is breaking all the rules for him, one time buying him a $9 pair of reading glasses on eBay. This is about as big a transgression as you can get, but for the time being, their relationship is not sexual. For her efforts, Matt paints her a picture of her son, an 11 by 16 inch work that she's overjoyed with. Such a thing isn't easy to pass to someone in prison, so Palmer takes it from Matt, then drops it off in Mitchell's car. Since Palmer has all those years behind him, no one at the gate asks him what's in the package he now has that he didn't come in with. This is how lax things are. Week 52. Matt tells Mitchell he really needs a pair of gloves as his hands are hurting when he works out. Can she buy him some, he asks, telling her he's only too happy to paint something else for her. Hmm, she says. Can you do dogs? Sure, Matt says. Dogs aren't a problem. Week 53. Mitchell breaks the rules even more times, once calling Matt's daughter for him and passing on a message. It's at this point that Matt is thinking this love-struck woman will do absolutely anything for him. Meanwhile, even her husband Lyle knows she's been helping Matt and receiving these paintings in return. Lyle tells her one night, This ain't worth losing your job over, darling. They're nice paintings, but this could get you in serious trouble. He can snitch on Palmer if he wants, but there's one thing you don't do in prison, and that's tell on someone, even if you're a guard. Weeks 54 to 55. Mitchell keeps smuggling stuff in, including 70 containers of black and cayenne pepper, 10 10 ounce packages of Cafe Bustelo coffee, several decks of playing cards, and numerous other prohibited items. It's at this point that Sweat's busy brain gets going. Still irked about losing his cushy job, one day he turns to Matt and says, I just want to get out of this place. I want to be free. I want to go live somewhere away from everybody. He then says, if Mitchell will get you anything, why not ask her to bring stuff in we can use to escape? He says the gloves and the glasses will already come in handy, but they can do even better than that. 
We have the ideal situation right now, he tells Matt. Do you think she'll be up for it? Matt laughs and says, she's freaking nuts. She'll bring us whatever she wants. Just tell me what you need and I'll get her to bring it in. Sweat envisions getting through his cell door by exploiting a vulnerability in the locking system and then walking to the yard where he'll use his new tools to get a rope over the wall. He tells Matt he needs a star-headed screw bit and some putty, and later Mitchell doesn't let him down. Matt tells her these things are for his art and the frames he'll make. Week 56 through 59. Sweat changes his mind and says to Matt, what about getting through the sewer system? He says for this they'll have to be in cells next to each other. He explains that they'll saw through the wall, get into the tunnels he thinks are back there. Matt asks for another favor from Palmer. Can he help get Sweat back into the tailor shop? Not necessarily his tailor shop, but any of them. If this happens, it'll mean Sweat gets a cell back in the honor block. Palmer does as he's asked, and stage one of the plan is complete. Week 60. Sweat is now working in the workshop 8. Matt is working not too far away in another shop. Mitchell occasionally now sees Sweat as they pass each other in the corridor. Each time she smiles and surreptitiously gives his hand a little squeeze. This mother and wife, who's old enough to be his mother, is acting like a love-struck teenager. For the time being, she had no idea about any escape plan, but she's more than willing to bring stuff in for Sweat and Matt. Week 61. Sweat is now in cell A623, right next to Matt in cell A622. He was assigned another cell on the block, but has paid the guy in A623 $100 worth of smokes and given him some homemade pornography books. Sweat says to Matt, we need saws, hacksaw blades, that's what you need Tilly to bring in, as many as possible. Five hours later. Mitchell is at a Walmart store close to her house, handing over $6 for a bunch of hacksaw blades. She uses cash even though she's already used her credit card to buy other items. The next day, she places them at the side of Matt's workstation. Back in the cells, Matt gives three of them to Sweat. It's time to do some sawing. During the evening, they both use the blades to start cutting a 10 by 10 inch hole through the 3 16 inch thick rear steel wall. As handles for the blades, they use rubber bands wrapped around cloth. To prevent any noise when they move the heavy table away from the wall, they put tape under the table legs. The sound of the sawing is also obscured, much thanks to the general din of a prison and the fact that every evening guys slam dominoes down on tables. They've sawn their first tiny hole. Success! There are air vents and attached ducts behind the wall, which will also have to be sawn through in time. The little bits of filings will be picked up by magnets the guys have stolen from the workshop. Weeks 64 through 65. They do this every day from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. when most of the other prisoners are in the mess hall or the recreation area. The officers are never suspicious. Sweat and Matt rarely eat in the mess hall, and during the evenings it's quite normal for them to paint in their cells. They only ever cut one at a time for 10 to 20 minutes, while the other uses a mirror to look down the landing for approaching guards. If a guard is seen, both men jump into their beds and pretend to be asleep or look like they're painting or listening to music. One day, Palmer almost catches them, but he's just come by to give them some more prison hooch of which Matt drinks a ton. It takes Sweat three weeks to cut a hole that's 17 inches by 12 and a half inches. For Matt, an 18 and a half by 14 and a half inch is complete in four weeks. The older, bigger man is always lagging behind, which in time to come will be a matter of life and death. Week 66. When Sweat's able to crawl through his hole, he starts leaving a dummy in his bed, so if the guards walk past his cell, they'll think he's sleeping. The dummy is hardly a work of art, and if those guards just paid any attention, they'd likely see it for what it was a pair of stuffed pants and a prison-issue sweatshirt. Once sweats through a hole, he clips a painting against the outside with magnets he's stolen. Now he's free to explore. Week 67. One day, when he returns after his adventure, he tells Matt that he feels like a ninja. What freedom he has during these nights. But what he doesn't know is the hidden complexities of a giant prison. One night, Sweat manages to descend down three tiers. There he finds himself in a place that's littered with objects that have been thrown away over the years. Cigarette butts, bits of paper, styrofoam cups, and plastic bottles. After a bit of a walkabout, he gets to B Block, just below the laundry building. This is progress. To get from B Block to C Block, he has to crawl through a steel pipe and that pipe is blocked by a steel brace. Cutting this will not be easy at all. Even if he can, he's not sure if the heavyset mat will be able to squeeze through the pipe. Luckily for them, Sweat has found a measuring tape on his nightly walks, so he can now measure the pipe and also Matt. Matt will be able to get through the pipe, but it won't be easy. Weeks 68 through 70. It takes Sweat two days to saw through the brace, only to become somewhat discouraged not to find the sewer system but some old boards in front of a great big cement wall. This is now turning into a mission of intense labor, but it's that or getting old in prison. He spends the next few nights shuffling around the subterranean maze of passageways under blocks C, D, and E, but he keeps hitting more cement walls. At least he's got tools and a nightlight, but he has to be careful. He's so close to the catwalk, up above he can see the guards walking around. One night, a discarded cigarette butt hits his head, and when he looks up, he sees a pair of officer's shoes. 
Just one wrong move and he's done. Sweat is so tired from these nightly jaunts that he never gets enough sleep. Each night after head count at 11.30, he leaves his cell and he doesn't get back until 5.30 a.m. That's how much work he's doing, and he can hardly just sleep during the day. He has to work, and if he tries to sleep, someone will get suspicious. He looks so ragged that an officer remarks that Sweat's appearance has changed. My god, what the hell's happened to him? The officer tells another officer. He looks as if he's been wrung through a knot hole. He's so frail and exhausted. That's true. Sweat has lost 30 pounds since he started this exploration. Still, he is now fit as a fiddle, and this will bode well for him in the near future when he's on the run and has to turn into a veritable Iron Man. Week 71 Sweat now admits to himself that the only way to freedom is to take apart one of those cement walls. He starts removing three or four bricks a night out of the wall that is just three layers thick. He's basically dismantling a prison from the inside, which is why the authorities will be astounded in the time to come. As luck will have it, one day Sweat opens a contractor's gang box in a tunnel under E-Block, and inside is a gift from God, a sledgehammer. This won't be the last time he gets so lucky that he'll start thinking he has angels on his side. Let's just say here that he doesn't think he deserved to get such a long prison sentence. He thinks the sledgehammer is his good karma. Weeks 72 through 74 He has to do the wall smashing ever so delicately, only striking the bricks whenever the pipes start to moan and scream. Within two weeks, he's breached the wall. This is it. Now he's close to the outside. Or at least he thinks he is. After winding through yet more tunnels, he comes across his biggest obstacle yet. That's a seven-foot thick son of a gun in the shape of a perimeter wall of the entire prison. At least he knows this is the last thing he has to get through. It's impossible. The wall's a huge block of cement that can only be knocked down with a machine. Even Matt joins him down there for a couple days when he's just too exhausted to do the work by himself. Matt's highly impressed with all the work Sweat's done. He looks at him and says, man, I can't believe you've done this. I've given up weeks ago. Matt's seen everything in his life. He's a career criminal who got involved seriously with crime at a young age. Later in life, a cop once described him as being the most vicious evil person I've ever come across in 38 years as a police officer. Matt escaped from a care home for children when he was 12 by riding away on a horse. He stayed alone in the forest for two weeks. Even with his crazy existence of his, he thinks Sweat's tunnels are on another level. Still, Sweat cannot get through the wall. No amount of bashing with a sledgehammer will work. Now he has another idea. There's a steam pipe. Why not crawl through that? It's another tight space at just 24 inches and it's hot as hell but Sweat thinks it's doable. Normally, you wouldn't be able to crawl through hot steam, but it's now May and the prison has just turned off its heating system. It'll still be warm in there and it's 20 feet long, but it can be done. Week 73 through 75. He struggles with the pipe, but after buying an extension cord from the prison commissary and rigging up some more lights, he knows he can take his time. He then returns to that gang box of tools and inside is a power drill, a hammer, an angle grinder, battery packs, more lights, and even some masks for all the dust. Again, he puts this down to karma and the wrongs of America's justice system. He still needs more tools, so he tells Matt to tell Mitchell to buy two chisels, a steel punch, and some bits for the drill. Stuff they say they need for picture frames and other handiwork. This won't be easy to sneak in, but then Matt gets the idea for Mitchell to hide the bits in ground beef and then freeze the meat. If anyone asks, she'll say it's for the guys to make burgers. If anyone complains, well, that's harassment. She tells Matt she feels guilty about what she's been doing to her husband Lyle as Lyle's arranging a surprise anniversary gift for her, one of Matt's paintings. She tries her hardest to stay out of his way. She now has a new word for Lyle calling him a glitch in her life. Week 76 It's at this point that Matt tells her that he and Sweat are going to escape. That's why they've been asking for so many things. Sweat will be upset about Matt doing this, but Matt knows Mitchell won't breathe a word about it. She's attracted to Matt, but she hasn't given up on loving Sweat. Now she thinks if these guys leave, I've lost everything. She won't tell on them, but them going is something she doesn't want to think about. Matt can sense this, and for the first time he starts to get nervous. What if she does lose her cool and blabs? He talks to Sweat about it, and they come up with an idea. Week 77 and 78 Matt puts his arm around Mitchell's waist when they're in the storeroom, and he whispers in her ear, Why don't you come with us? He tells her she can finally be rid of that useless husband, and he and Sweat will take care of her. This manipulation goes a step further when Matt and Sweat agree that Sweat needs to confess his undying love for Mitchell. Matt starts passing her letters that Sweat has written, notes that talk about how much she misses her, and signs off with XOXOXO. I want to feel myself inside of you, he writes, while he and Matt laugh out loud. And after this, she starts bringing in so many tools Sweat's pipe cutting gets easier. In one letter, he writes, I love you, can't wait to get you in my arms and make love to you. Then at the bottom he writes, P.S. I need some more of those drill bits, XOXOXO. All these notes are destroyed after reading, just as Matt's told her to do. Week 79 But Matt feels she still needs to be worked on more. 
One day, he finds an opportunity to move things along when they're both together in a room next to Taylor Shop 9. Matt says he needs a machine part, but he doesn't really. He grabs her out of the blue and kisses her. For a moment, she's taken aback, but man, is this guy strong. And he's so attractive. Still, she thinks, does he have to be so forceful? You can love two people, you know, Matt says. We both love you. This is a man with extreme violence toward women in his criminal history. His sweet words are tinged with so much darkness. Almost immediately, it's arranged that she'll be the getaway driver once they're on the outside. And she'll have the car and she'll have food and money. As she's lying in bed with Lyle, ignoring his entreaties to have sex, she sees the three of them with a motorbike rental business somewhere on the coast of Mexico. The next day, she goes out to buy some new underwear, sexier than her usual stuff. Poor Lyle thinks it's for him. Week 80. The inmates notice that Mitchell starts dressing nicer and suddenly she's losing lots of weight and doing her hair differently. During her lunch break, she reads her new book, Madrigal's Magic Key to Spanish. What they don't know is that at home she's taking photos of herself naked and later handing them to Matt so both he and Sweat can utilize them while they're alone in their cells. She's living a fantasy. Her photos are burned and certainly not used to facilitate orgasm. Matt tells her to buy black cargo pants for the escape. On the honor block, you have to wear prison-issue pants, even though you can have civilian tops. He tells her to get a tent, some sleeping bags, fishing poles, and a hatchet. Oh, he says, we'll also need one rifle, one shotgun, and a load of ammunition. Off she goes to the hardware store and later to the gas station to pick up a map of the local area and beyond. Matt and Sweat decide that at first, after escaping, they'll drive a few hours and rent a cabin up in the mountains in Vermont. Matt and Mitchell will pretend to be husband and wife, and Sweat will be the nephew. This plan changes pretty quickly after Matt says he has connections with the Mexican drug cartels, so if they get to Mexico, they'll have a safe place to hide before they head to the beach and start their new business. The plan suits everyone, but more so Matt, who has a tattoo on his body saying, Mexico forever. Week 81 Sweat tells Mitchell via a note handed to Matt that they should go scuba diving together once they're there, which almost brings tears to her eyes. As much as she's attracted to Matt, her future fantasy is with Sweat only. When that happens, Sweat will have already changed his name to James Tuttle and Matt will be Tony Goya. That's the plan anyway. It's about this time that Matt makes a strange request. He asks Mitchell to smuggle in a bottle of Bacardi 151 and a bottle of wild turkey. Let's just say that Matt has had alcohol problems in the past and as you'll soon find out, booze is going to play a big part in what happens to him. She does as is told but draws the line when he asks her for a handgun, a micro knife, and a cell phone. You might now be wondering, what about Mitchell's ever faithful husband? He adores his wife. He would chop off his right hand to keep her safe. Will she not miss him one bit? One day, Matt asks her about him, to which she replies with a snarl, Oh, pop my husband, he's worth more to me dead than he is alive. She means it too. She tells the guys that on the night they leave, they should go to her house and shoot her husband dead with the gun she's bought for them. She's done with him, he's boring, he's a creep, and God knows she can't stand sharing a bed with him. She looks at Matt in all seriousness, as if she's thought about this a lot in the night, and says, or I'll drug him until he's passed out and then we'll take the car and drive him off a cliff. At least that won't look like murder, she says. Even Matt with his dark past is thinking this woman is cold. Matt agrees and Sweat also agrees, but they're both playing her. Still, Matt goes to the prison hospital and gets some pain medication for a nerve pain he has. He later passes them on to Mitchell and tells him to keep him in her purse until the big night. Week 82. It's almost time, and Sweat is just about done with the steam pipe. It's thick and it breaks a lot of blades, but two pounds of hamburger meat stuffed with blades saves the day again. Mitchell does the stuffing, but Palmer is the one who takes it out of the freezer and walks it to the block without going through the metal detectors. He has no idea what's in the meat, though. The heat is now killing Sweat as he tries to cut the exit hole in the other end of the pipe. He again puts his brilliant mind into action and makes a ventilation system using the fan, a bunch of plastic bags, and a t-shirt. He fastens all the bags together to make a tube and connects them with rubber bands to the fan. And hey presto, he can now stay in the pipe for hours at a time. Week 84 Sweat pushes out the last bit of pipe. On the other side, he walks for a while until he sees a manhole. He then cuts the chain it's locked with using his hacksaw blades and pushes it out. It's his first taste of freedom in years. Looking over the street, he sees the local school, and boy does he grin a wide grin. He knows he's at the intersection of Barker Street and Box Street, and he knows the guards in the towers can't see this area. It's 4 in the morning and he thinks, right then man, I could just go now and have 90 minutes until they do morning roll call. But he puts an end to that thought and remembers he must stick to his word and get Matt out too. His loyalty might just be his downfall. When he gets back to his cell, even though he doesn't smoke, he lights a cigarette and uses a mirror to show Matt what he's doing. Matt whispers back, are you serious? Are you kidding me? You made it through? Sweat takes a drag and replies, no dude, I made it out twice, and I came back. 
They decide they'll go in the night. Sweat writes one last letter to Mitchell and it says, Tonight's the night. Meet us at midnight. Park your car at the manhole in the intersection of Barker Street and Box Street. Leave it running, but turn off the headlights. Get out of the car and pretend you're on the phone. That way, if anyone sees you, they won't become suspicious. See you soon, my love. XOXOXO. P.S. I can already see a swimming with manta rays. She doesn't know what a manta ray is, but it sounds exotic. The question is, can they rely on her? Sweat doesn't know that she's been stressed of late. A few days ago, there was a big fight in the prison and it looked like there'd be a full lockdown. This always gets to people, but there was also an incident in the workshop when a new officer turned up and actually did his job, meaning he told Mitchell not to get too close to the prisoners, especially Matt. She huffed and puffed and slammed a few doors, and she did wonder if the prison was somehow onto her. It got worse when the officer told her to get away from Matt's workstation even though she told him there was no work to do right then. This was harassment. She shouted at him, leave my freaking inmates alone. If they don't have any freaking work, they can't do no work now, can they? The officer shot back, ma'am, I'm security. We can't be having this in the shop. What a bully, she thought. How dare he? She kept quiet, though knowing that any more trouble could get in the way of the guys escaping. She couldn't sleep for a few nights after that. Week 85. The last time she got to talk with Matt, he tells her, if you're not there, we're dead. They're going to kill us, you understand? They're going to kill us. She nods her head like a chastised child. June 5th, 2015. Hour 1, the day of the escape. The inmates on the honor block are surprised when Matt gives away his colored TV. In the next cell, Sweat puts all his things together in a guitar case. Clothes, new boots, 20 packs of peanuts, 40 granola bars, and 12 sticks of pepperoni. He doesn't know it yet, but they're going to need that food in a big way. Hour 23. The two leave through their holes. They follow the tunnels and are on their way. Sweat leaves the smiley face note and another one with a picture of an alien. Are you trying me, punk? He's written on the picture. It's stuck to a metal surface with a stolen magnet. Another kick in the teeth for the authorities. When they arrive at the steam pipe, Sweat enters and makes it through easily. Matt gets stuck, so Sweat has to throw a sheet and drag him out. When Matt comes out of the other end, his pants are down. Sweat smiles and says, oh Matt, I didn't know you cared. It's 11.50, a bit too early, but they get out through the manhole anyway and wait on the road. Under his breath, Sweat says, Shawshank ain't got nothing on me. It's true, this is better than any Shawshank escape. It's the greatest escape in US prison history, but it's not over yet. Sweat knows that they don't look too sketchy standing there in the street, even if they are wearing prison issue pants. They have a guitar case and let's face it, who escapes from prison with a guitar? They're just two guys who have been out playing with their band. Hour 24. Things then take a turn for the worse. Matt sees a car coming down the street and he bolts into someone's garden. Sweat just stands there, thinking why the hell is he running? The driver sees Matt, gets out of his car and shouts, hey, what are you freaking scumbags doing in my yard? Sweat replies, oh man, I'm sorry, I apologize. We're just cutting through, we're on the wrong street. Thankfully, the guy seems to believe him even though there's a prison just up the street. The guitar case must have worked. This guy will later tell the cops, who escapes with a guitar case? But Matt is wired as hell and every time he thinks he hears a car, he bolts again. This is making Sweat very anxious. Rick, he says, just act normal. We are normal, we're civilians. Matt has issues, mental health issues, and inside the prison, that hasn't always been obvious to Sweat. Now that they're on the outside, he sees the desperation in Matt. He knows he'll strike first and ask questions later, if anyone should even look like they're getting in the way. 24 hours, 50 minutes. Why does Mitchell fail to turn up? And who exactly are these two convicts now free to do what they want on the outside? They both curse under their breaths. Unbelievable, she backed out. This is what love means to her, thinks Matt, who's offended even though he's gladly cut her head off with a blunt knife. Where is she? What's happened? Earlier that day, at 3.30 p.m., Mr. and Mrs. Mitchell clock off from work and head home, stopping for something to eat on the way. In her purse are those pills. She's panicking, and all through dinner she can't eat a thing. Lyle sits opposite, as always, concerned about her. Are you okay, Tilly? He says. She ignores him, as she always does. When they're home, she says she feels strange. It's a feeling she's never had before. She's dizzy. Her heart is beating faster. Something's wrong. What's happening to me, she thinks. It's a panic attack. The first one she's ever had in her life. Lyle tells her to sleep it off, but when she wakes about 9 p.m., it's starting to happen again. Lyle then drives her to the ER, where the guys are waiting on the street. At midnight, she's in the hospital. At 2 a.m., she tells Lyle, you go home. I'll be okay here by myself. In her mind, when he goes home, he's going to meet with two men with a history of violence. She believes they're going to kill Lyle because that's the plan. They'll then take the car and drive away. The next morning, she's surprised when Lyle turns up at the hospital and says he's taking her home. He gives her a big hug and she looks over his shoulder, wondering what the hell's going on. Now, we must explain something. Two men are on the loose and they will not go back to prison, never mind what it takes to stay out. You need to know why they're in prison in the first place. Both of them had horrid upbringings, but Matt's was arguably worse. 
He was in and out of foster homes as a child, and when he did see his family, it was often in an environment of extreme violence. By the time he was a teenager, he was already stealing cars, taking drugs, and beating people up, including women. He escaped from the children's home, and later he escaped from jail. One time in jail, he agreed to kill another inmate's wife and children, for a price, of course. That inmate turned out to be an informant, but if that plan had gone through, Matt could have murdered innocent people. On December 3, 1997, Matt and another guy turned up the house of William Rickerson, Matt's former employee. Rickerson ran a food brokerage firm and Matt knew he always kept lots of cash. It was a cash business with hefty takings. Matt needed some money, wanting to head to Canada where his stripper girlfriend was waiting. The guy, getting on in age, had always liked Matt and tried to help him any way he could. It was this trust that helped Matt get into his house. He punched his frail body as soon as he walked through the door and then started looking for the cash. Matt grew angrier when he couldn't find any, tying Rickerson's hands and feet and beating him around the face. They then kidnapped him and shoved him in the trunk of their car. They stopped the car on the highway and opened the trunk. Matt punched Rickerson, stabbed him in the leg, and demanded to know where the money was. The old guy said he had no money. He would never had a safe or anything like that. After 27 hours of intermittent torture, Matt started to believe him. There was no money. But now Rickerson would go and tell the cops, and Matt would end up back in prison. Looking at Rickerson covered in blood and bruises, Matt slammed the trunk. The next time he opened it, he strangled him. He pulled the dead body out of the trunk at the side of the road and covered it with sticks. Later, Matt returned to the scene of the crime with a hacksaw, did the dismembering, and threw bits into the Niagara River. He then fled to Mexico, where he later stabbed an American engineer while they were both in a bathroom. The guy died and Matt got away with only a few bucks. The Mexican cops later arrested Matt and in 2007 the Mexican government extradited him back to the US. A report said he'd been a difficult prisoner and had tried to escape getting shot at a few times doing so. The Mexicans didn't want him. No one wanted to be near him. Even his own former attorney in the US said Rick Matt was fun but dangerous guy to hang around with. In court, Matt heard his parole was up in 2032 when if he survived he'd be an old man. God, he hated prison. When a detective who'd known Matt all his life heard that he had escaped from prison, he said it's not a good feeling to know he's out there. Anything's possible with Rick Matt. Sweat was not anywhere close to Matt in terms of danger, but he too had a troubled youth, not afraid of using violence. He was always known as the brains of the operation when he and others committed burglaries. But he also got caught and, like Matt, did some time in prison early in life. Then on June 4, 2002, he and two other guys were on their way trying to deliver some firearms they'd stolen when a young sheriff's deputy pulled them over. This man had a wife and two young children at home. A guy sleeping in his house nearby heard three pops which startled him from his sleep. Soon after, he heard a car screeching. He put on some clothes and went to see what was up. He found the young cop lying in the park on the tarmac, his body horribly twisted from being run down by a car. As he lay on the floor, the car had reversed over him, and he still wasn't dead though. He pleaded for his life and cried out that he had kids at home, and then one of the guys fired two bullets into his face. Sweat later admitted in court that he had fired the first shots at the officer but not the two that hit him in the face. He said he only fired back because the officer pulled a gun on him first. Sweat hit him once, but it was just a nick. The court heard that after that, the driver reversed over him. Sweat got out and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, only for the other kid to fire those bullets. The family of the victim wanted Sweat and his friends executed, but after a guilty plea, he got life behind bars. He always felt bad about what had happened that night, but he also believed he didn't deserve to grow old in prison. His friends were crazy, not him. Sweat's sentence was life without parole, so the thought of escaping never left his mind. Day 2 After the Escape Mitchell is under suspicion soon after police find the tunnel and talk to prison officers and other inmates. Sweat and Matt are covering as many miles as possible, sticking to the woods. Everyone's after them, the cops, the US Marshals, the FBI, the border cops, and the rangers. A $75,000 reward is on their backs, and people are told to approach with great caution. I have no idea, says Mitchell when the state cops ask her if she knows where Matt and Sweat might be. They don't know she's involved, but they have a good idea she is. The prison staff have already talked about all her close relationships with the pair and her habit of taking things in for them. She pretends to be as shocked as anyone, saying at one point how the hell did they get out of Clinton Correctional because I just, I've never heard anybody getting out of here. That's why I just, I mean, how did they even escape out of here? She is as bad an actress as she is a wife. The next day she cracks up a little bit saying, okay, I might have brought some stuff in for them but I never knew what they were up to. She certainly doesn't admit to planning to go with them and have her husband killed. But as time goes on, she folds. She admits most of the story, but not everything. The only ones who know the full story are the ones on the run. On June 12th, Mitchell is arrested on a felony charge of promoting prison contraband and misdemeanor criminal facilitation. Little by little, over many hours of interviews, she talks more and more about what really happened. Days 4 through 10 
Even with hundreds of people looking for them and bloodhounds scouring the local forests, the pair manage to evade the authorities. It's believed they're heading to Canada, but it could be Mexico, or they could just be staying put. No one really knows. What is actually happening is they have found a cabin in the woods, and it looks like it's not being used for a long time. There, they get some needed rest and some food, and they even find a 20-gauge shotgun. Sweat thinks again the angels must be watching over him. He's vindicated in this respect again when he goes to the bathroom and finds a loaded pistol hidden above the door. They find something else, too. But at this, Sweat is not impressed. There's a big stash of booze that Matt soon starts swigging down in enormous quantities. Sweat's trying to get them to freedom, and it's as if Matt doesn't care. He's getting wasted like a teenager who's found the key to the family booze cabinet. Matt says he needs it. They've walked and run around 30 miles already. Both have blisters on their feet and cuts and bruises on their bodies. When Sweat reprimands him, the much larger Matt gives him a look that says, I've killed people for less, know your place, little guy. But again, Sweat realizes that Matt is very unstable and he's certainly not the type of man you want to fight. He doesn't dare say anything when Matt refuses to stop drinking the next day or even turn off the TV he's always watching. Day 11 and 12 They can't stay in the cabin forever, so they head off. Now though, Matt's half-baked and he can't keep up. When Sweat loses his temper, again there's a threat of violence. Matt still has the shotgun, and Sweat has the pistol. It's around this time that Palmer's charged with a bunch of felony crimes all related to the things he's done for the guys. He will resign from his job, spend six months in jail, and pay $5,000 in fines. Day 20 They're both waiting at the side of the road when Matt says he's going to hold up a car with a rifle. Bad idea, thinks Sweat. He pleads with him not to do it, it will attract unnecessary attention, and he also knows that Matt will not think twice about killing someone. That's not what Sweat wants. Nonetheless, Matt waits in the woods close to the road with his gun, still drunk. Sweat shakes his head. They'll never work, he thinks. And so he runs, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs. They've already covered 50 miles, but Sweat has the energy of an athlete after doing what he did under the prison. As he's taking off, a car has seen Matt and reported him to the cops. Soon, a U.S. Border Patrol supervisory agent is on the scene. Matt won't run, and he won't go back to prison. He stumbles forward with a gun and takes a bullet from the agent's M4 rifle. As the agent walks toward the body, he can smell booze from yards away. Matt's blood alcohol level is 0.18, a classification that comes with the word mentally impaired. In his final moments, he might just remember those lines in the Bible, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Day 22 Sweat has been running for so long. He's exhausted, but now within one and a half miles of the US-Canada border. He can almost taste freedom, but then, when crossing a hayfield, his luck finally runs out. He's spotted by a state trooper who just so happens to be a firearms instructor. Sweat runs and the officer shouts at him to stop while aiming his gun. He doesn't stop, and a second later he's lying on the ground having taken bullets to the shoulder and arm from a 45 caliber Glock 37 pistol. Sweat's grim future. He will survive, and in time he'll end up in special housing units in the maximum security Five Points Correctional Facility. This is the place where he'll write up a very cogent escape plan and try to trade it with the prison. This is how someone can escape, he'll tell the warden. Now I've told you that, can I please see my new girlfriend? That didn't work out for him, and he was moved to another prison. In 2022, he went on a hunger strike against the terrible conditions he was kept in. A judge ruled that the state could force feed him after being restrained, and drug him if necessary. That's what you get for embarrassing the powers that be and costing the state $23 million. Sweat remains in prison today and he'll be fully locked down for years to come. Years after the escape, the lovebirds. Lastly, what about Mrs. Mitchell and her dear husband Lyle? She has always denied wanting her husband killed, but the evidence shows otherwise. An official 142-page report states, despite her claims to the contrary, Mitchell took steps consistent with plans to murder Lyle Mitchell. The report states she admitted she took pills from Matt, but in one interview she said she'd forgotten about them, and in a separate interview she said she had flushed him down the toilet. One time she said she's never even been given any pills. That's not what Sweat said, and it's his version of the events where we get much of the other story. Mr. Mitchell has always stood by his wife's side despite the criticism he's taken for it. In an interview he said, do I still love her? Yes. Am I mad? Yes. All I want is for my wife to be coming home. She would never have gone through with it. That's what she told me, and that she really loved me. Now that's a dedicated husband, or an abused one lacking in confidence. Mitchell was sentenced to two and a third to seven years in state prison. The report states she was ordered to pay restitution of $79,841 and a 10% surcharge to the state for costs relating to the repair of the walls in Matt and Sweat cells and pipes and walls in the tunnels. She got out in 2020, soon after she found herself getting takeout food with Lyle. It was just like the old days. In the truck, she looked at Lyle and his familiar buck-tooth smile. The glitch wasn't so bad. A quiet life wasn't so awful. 
Imagine a man trapped in a room that's two paces across and four paces long. His bed is a concrete slab with a small rubber mattress and a thin blanket. His desk has only a concrete stool, and no matter where in this tiny room he lingers, his toilet is never further than a few feet away. He hasn't seen the sun in weeks, and when he's allowed outside, he is quickly shuttled to a caged-in area that is just four paces across and eight paces long. Inside is a deflated soccer ball and nothing more. This man is only allowed to write to or receive mail from a very restricted list of individuals, and any outgoing letters undergo intense scrutiny and censorship, taking up to three months to be delivered. A reply letter undergoes the same process, and if not rejected outright, will take another three months before the man can read it. You're just imagining this cruelty, but for many, it's a daily reality that they have lived in for years. Welcome to H-Unit at Colorado's Federal Supermax Prison, otherwise known as Hell on Earth. Isolation, solitary, or special housing units have been a punitive measure employed by prisons for centuries. While in the past a prisoner may have been thrown into solitary on a whim, today in our modern prison system it's supposed to be used only as a punishment for prison offenders or for the safety of individuals who may be at risk within the general population. Though solitary is meant to punish bad behavior and ostensibly to correct it, psychological studies dating back over the last 150 years have consistently shown that solitary confinement is extremely psychologically harmful. Individuals kept in solitary for long amounts of time can develop a form of PTSD and can become extremely averse to loud noises or bright lights. They exhibit extreme antisocial behaviors, which can be counterintuitive when the goal of the incarceration is to correct bad behavior. Instead of teaching an inmate a lesson, solitary confinement can in fact make an inmate even more dangerous and aggressive. In one famous case, an inmate released straight from isolation into parole at the end of his sentence murdered Colorado Department of Corrections Executive Director Tom Clements. The inmate had spent years in solitary confinement getting only an hour of exercise a day if the staff allowed it, which they often did not. In an outdoors cage where he remained, you guessed it, alone. Then one day he was a free man and promptly took revenge for his treatment. Solitary had turned a dangerous man even more dangerous and had clearly failed its intended purpose. Crime must be punished. That's a basic tenet of any nation which operates under the rule of law. But where is the line drawn between punishment and torture? Many Americans today on both the left and right of the political spectrum agree that solitary confinement for extreme lengths of time is inhumane, and the data clearly shows that it's counterproductive to rehabilitation, yet it remains a popular punishment at many modern prisons. Think back to the man at the start of the show. He lives in a cell that is two paces across and four paces long, sleeps on a concrete slab, has only a concrete stool to sit on, and lives and eats with his open-faced toilet always within arm's reach. He hasn't been allowed to send or receive mail in months, and on average might look forward to two letters a year maximum. The longest conversations he holds are with the guards that bring him his food and these are over in seconds. He's lived in the same tiny cell for years, and with a life sentence, he will most likely remain there until the day he dies. For most people, that scenario sounds nightmarish, and some part of their humanity still cries out for at least some basic compassion for someone sentenced to life in prison. Keep them locked up by all means, but is it really necessary to keep them imprisoned in such a tiny cell for the rest of their lives? Now, we want you to think about that man again and ask yourself, what if that man was a terrorist? Would your feelings on his basic rights and treatment change at all? The hypothetical scenario we've been having you think about is not hypothetical at all, but rather a reality for dozens of inmates held at H-Unit in Colorado's Federal Supermax Prison. These inmates range from drug lords to major gang leaders and terrorists, and include domestic Christian as well as Muslim radicals. Al-Qaeda operatives live next door to white supremacists who have planned massive acts of violence against minority communities and been caught the same as their Islamic terrorist counterparts. Known as the Alcatraz of the Rockies, this is where the federal government sends the most dangerous men in America. For these men, they live life inside a prison that is itself within a prison. Forbidden from contact with the general population, they instead spend 23 hours a day locked up in their tiny cells. Described by a former warden as a clean version of hell, civil rights attorneys have argued that it was more accurately a dirty version of hell. That's because for years the federal government also kept its most psychotic prisoners locked up here, where they mutilated themselves, talked to ghosts, and lived in feces-smeared isolation cells for months at a time. 
Even for the non-psychotic prisoners though, H-Unit is hell on earth. These individuals are subject to what are known as Special Administrative Measures or SAMs, measures which govern the rights of prisoners who are deemed to pose a serious ongoing threat to public safety and national security. On top of their extreme isolation, SAM prisoners are not allowed any contact with the outside world whatsoever, aside from a very carefully selected and screened number of contacts that typically only include close family members and their attorneys. This is because of the fear that a prisoner may communicate via code to criminal or terrorist organizations around the world. In fact, one such case happened in 2005, when three prisoners wrote letters to suspected terrorists in Europe exhorting jihad. The prisoners denied that their letters were anything more than generic personal communications, but the FBI considered the incident a serious security lapse. Now, the people a prisoner under SAM restrictions are allowed to contact is severely limited, and the individual on the receiving end of a letter has to be vetted by federal law enforcement officials before being approved for contact. That makes for a rather short list of people that a SAM prisoner may be able to communicate with, and even then their letters are thoroughly screened and censored a process which can take months. Replies are also screened just as thoroughly, adding months on the way back. As one prisoner noted, he simply gave up writing letters to his mother, as it would take three months for her to receive it and three months for him to receive a reply. These prisoners are afforded very limited phone calls, and the ones they are allowed to place are extremely restricted and very closely monitored by FBI and Bureau of Prisons who listen to every word. Even then, phone privileges are very few and far between, which makes keeping up with the lives of loved ones practically impossible. Until only recently, SAM prisoners were not allowed to watch news broadcasts at all, for fear that modern day events might inflame some radical thoughts and behavior. Of what limited television time a prisoner may have, which is afforded only to SAM inmates who have earned tier 3 privileges after years of good behavior, channels are often simply blacked out. Things such as newspapers and magazines are on a 30-day delay, and political articles are ripped out of the magazines before being given to prisoners. Day-to-day -day life involves their tiny 75-square-foot cell where they stay for 23 hours a day. While they're supposed to be allowed one hour of outside recreation per day, often this doesn't happen if the short-handed staff is too busy or if they simply don't feel like allowing the prisoner out. When they do get to experience their one hour of rec, they must do so in a metal cage that is approximately four paces wide and eight paces long, or about twice the size of their cell. Often prisoners can enjoy a basketball hoop and a deflated soccer or basketball. Still, for men who have spent a decade or more being locked up alone in a tiny cell, just being outdoors again is a reward enough. H-Unit prisoners do not have their own shower, as most solitary units do, and instead they are escorted to a shower several days each week. However, this too can be disrupted by lockdowns or staffing issues. One prisoner, Umar Farooq Abdul-Motalab, otherwise known as the failed underwear bomber, explained what his life inside H-Unit was like recently. He claimed that prison staff harassed him for his religion and did their best to disrupt his practice of it. He says that he was given no access to a halal diet, and corrections officers would often mock him and desecrate both his Quran and prayer rug. He also says that he was subjected to humiliating strip searches in front of female staff, something deeply offensive for devout Muslims. If the list of abuses sounds familiar, it's because many of these same abuses were being regularly carried out on prisoners in the infamous Abu Ghraib prison by US service members. Abdul Mutalab was also forbidden from praying with others in his religion's mandatory group prayers, and he had little if any access to the contracted imam. While he used to be housed in a regular supermaximum security prison, once he was moved to H-Unit, contact with many of his friends and relatives with which he'd been allowed to correspond for years was cut off, including with his own sister. Books he ordered from Amazon to help him pass the time were also rejected without reason. Curiously, one such rejected book was The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing. Abdul Mutalab's treatment is hardly unique, and a recent complaint filed in federal court states that Mr. Abdul Mutalab experiences life in H Unit at ADX as a struggle to avoid becoming mentally ill. The stories of other prisoners brought to life by the federal complaint paint a picture of life at H Unit as a slow journey into oblivion, a relentless whittling away of family ties, memories, hopes, and even a sense of self. Nidal Ayad, another inmate, says that if he had heard some of the stories of what happens inside H-Unit five years ago, he would have thought that they were crazy. But now he tells of prisoners so deeply disturbed by their years of isolation that they warn him to turn off his cell's light because it emits harmful radiation. 
These prisoners live inside dark cells day and night, and some even claim that hot water is poisonous and harmful. Clearly, the mental stress of living in isolation has created a host of psychological problems for these individuals. It can be easy to disregard these complaints and simply write off H-Unit's inmates as nothing more than the scum of humanity who deserve exactly what they're getting. And with some of the world's most dangerous drug lords, gang leaders, and terrorists locked up inside, it's tempting to agree with the sentiment. Yet the conditions inside H-Unit speak loudly about our own values, but we shouldn't let the hatred and violence of others compromise our own values and the nation we strive to be. Justice must be served and evil must be punished. But how we do these things speaks more about who we really are as a society than our laws do. A man has just been arrested by police and is sitting in a room in the station handcuffed to a chair. Sitting in the same room are three detectives, so one would presume that this man could not go anywhere. One would be wrong, because this man has lip balm in his pocket, and he uses that to slip his hands out of his handcuffs. He then runs for it, and what ensues is a chase on foot that looks like something from Keystone Cops. This man we are talking about has been called one of the most brilliant escape artists in history, and now you'll see why. The man we're discussing is one Richard Lee McNair, and that escape we just mentioned was certainly not his greatest escape, not by a long way. McNair successfully escaped from the authorities three times, but it was his self-mailing escape and his life on the run that made him famous. Let's get back to the start, though. In 1987, when McNair was a month shy of his 30th birthday, he made a very bad choice. That bad choice was to try and break into and burgle a grain storage facility in a town called Minot in North Dakota. Why he wanted to do that, we just don't know. Because it wasn't as if McNair was unemployed or lacking intelligence. In fact, he had a job as a sergeant at the Minot Air Force Base that wasn't too far from the grain storage place. As McNair's brother once said, he just made some really bad decisions. That brother also said Richard was the smartest guy he ever met. Ok, so he was smart. But that didn't stop him from botching a burglary and shooting two men in the process. One of those men died and the other survived. McNair was quickly brought in for questioning, and he gave up a handgun at the same time. It was looking like the cops had their man, and McNair was looking at a life sentence. But as you know, things didn't go exactly as planned. And with the stick of lip balm, McNair decided to test the health and fitness of the local cops. He somehow managed to get out of the room and out of the police station. He proceeded to literally run for his life, something he'd do time and again in the future. He led the cops down a bunch of streets and then they chased him up the steps of a three-story building. By this time, there were cops everywhere and it was one of those, we've got this place surrounded, come out with your hands up situations. McNair then made another bad choice. He decided not to come out with his hands up and jumped from a third floor window into a tree. The branch he landed on snapped and McNair took a nasty fall. Now that McNair was broken, the cops could make an easy arrest. After a stint in the hospital, McNair was housed at Ward County Jail in Minot. It seems that he wasn't too pleased with his new home and he might have escaped again had the prison guards not found out that he chiseled a couple of cinder blocks loose in his cell. He was eventually sentenced to 30 years for the robbery and given two life sentences for murder and attempted murder. Ok, so we have one escape and one attempted escape, and now we have yet another escape. One that is not even his best escape. After a few years behind bars at the North Dakota State Penitentiary, McNair and two other guys managed to escape after crawling through the ventilation shafts. The two other guys didn't stay free for very long, but higher IQ McNair dyed his hair and did everything you should do to disguise yourself. He moved around the US for 10 months but was eventually captured. Ok, thought the authorities, it seems that some men you just can't teach, and they marked him as a problem inmate and moved him to the Minnesota Correctional Facility, Oak Park Heights. This place is the state's only level 5 maximum security prison. It houses what the authorities say are the worst of the worst, people with histories of violence or people like McNair, guys with a flair for escape. No one has ever escaped from this place and there has only been one murder in the prison. That's because prisoners are pretty much locked down during their incarceration. So there was no way he was getting out of that joint. He realized that, and so after a few years he joined a sit-down protest that eventually got him moved to the high-security United States Penitentiary, Florence High. Yet again, he realized that it was unlikely that he'd escape from that place, and so he managed to get himself moved to a high-security federal prison located in Louisiana. This was the place where he would perform his pièce de résistance. You see, he got a job in this prison, and that job was to fix torn mailbags so they could be sent back to the post office to be used. All the time McNair was doing this job, he was plotting yet another escape. 
The date it happened was April 5, 2006. McNair was almost 50 and had spent a good portion of his adult life behind bars for making that stupid choice back in the day to rob a grain facility. That morning, McNair managed to hide inside a pallet that was full of repaired mailbags. The pallet was later shrink-wrapped and you might wonder just how McNair managed to breathe. Well, the answer is he had created a kind of escape pod, and that included a tube that he could breathe through once he'd secretly pierced the packaging. The pallet was soon taken to a storage facility outside of the prison guards, and there, McNair waited inside his pod. When he heard the workers go for lunch, he got out of the pod and once more ran for his life. So this was lunchtime, and McNair knew very well that officers at the prison wouldn't know he was missing until about 4 p.m. He had four hours to run like hell toward the nearest town to get supplies and steal a car. The next part of the story is nothing short of unbelievable. So McNair is running near some railroad tracks and a cop thinks it's a bit weird and stops him, since the cop knows an inmate is on the loose. The cop asks McNair for ID, to which he replies that he has none. He tells the cop he's just doing some exercise. But then, when he's asked what his address is, McNair says he's staying at a nearby hotel with his brother. The cop then says, the problem is, we have an escapee on the loose. That's why McNair, who is now calling himself Robert Jones, has been stopped. The two laugh about this, and then the cop radios the station to ask if the subject wears glasses. He also asks for more information about the escapee's appearance. McNair could make a run for it any time, but he just stays there, waiting to see what the cop will do when he's on the radio. The cop explains to the other person on the line that he's looking at a man who's around 50, has bluish eyes, short hair, a goatee beard, and who wears glasses. The policeman says, well, you know the bad thing about it, you're matching up to him, to which McNair replies, well, that sucks, doesn't it? Somehow, McNair manages to convince a cop that he's staying at some hotel whose name he can hardly remember, which is close to some construction works. What's your name again, the cop asks. McNair makes the mistake of now saying Jimmy Jones. The cop actually sounds apologetic for harassing the jogger and then says, you wouldn't believe what those guys do. They got years and years to think about how they're going to do it. McNair must have thought, tell me about it. The next few minutes is McNair brilliantly describing the area where he's staying and again convincing the cop that he's staying at some small hotel and he's just out on his daily job. I promise you, I'm not the escapee, says McNair, to which the cop replies, you'd have done run by now. And then they both have a laugh about that. Just don't get run over by a train, says the cop. Soon after, McNair is off again on his run to freedom as the cop says, be careful, buddy. He was careful too, and his journey now would shock just about every household in North America. When Christmas time rolled around, McNair did something quite brazen. He actually sent the warden of his former prison a greeting card. The authorities were not too happy about this. McNair had totally embarrassed them and now he was rubbing pie in their faces. US Marshals put McNair on their 15 most wanted list, and his story appeared on the TV series America's Most Wanted. After over a year on the run, McNair was pulled over in Canada after the police had spotted the stolen car he was driving. At the roadside, while being questioned yet again, McNair made a run for it. As you can guess by now, McNair was pretty good at running. He outran the Canadian cops, and it wasn't until two days later that they realized that the car thief was that guy that had appeared on America's Most Wanted. The car was more closely examined and the cops found a camera. On that camera, there was lots of self-portraits of McNair. He hadn't been doing selfies out of narcissism, he'd been planning on making fake IDs. Investigators also found McNair's fingerprints in the car. The chase was on again. A few more days passed and McNair had stolen a motorbike and had already covered a lot of ground in the province of British Columbia. He then really hit the gas after stealing yet another car. To keep the authorities at bay, he crossed back into the US and drove across a few states. He then decided to drive back into Canada and drove all the way from Ontario to Vancouver. He planned to settle down in northern British Columbia at a place called Williston Lake and was about to buy some property there until he found out that there had been a pine beetle infestation in the area. He was also concerned that there weren't enough good escape routes if the cops should ever show up. If you're wondering how he managed to get the money to buy a property and survive on the run all that time, the answer is he stole a lot of cars, and we mean a lot. You see, he had once worked as a car showroom salesman, and he knew how to steal cars from those places without getting caught. He would take brand new cars, ones without GPS, and he would try to steal white cars because they usually blended in better. He would use those cars for a while, and then he'd sell them. That's how he got his cash. He appeared 12 times on America's Most Wanted, and there was even an 11-page piece written up about him in The New Yorker. He later said that he was surprised that he'd become so famous, or infamous. This was a problem for him, since just about everyone in North America who owned a TV knew what McNair looked like. 
but he managed to use computer technology to create driver's licenses and he also changed his appearance a lot. He even had laptops that he used just for solely monitoring what the press was saying about him. His downfall was his own ingenuity in the end, because he was captured when a Canadian cop noticed a van that seemed to have homemade tinted windows. McNair had made those tints himself, but the cop was suspicious because the van looked really expensive. The cop took the plate number and called it in. The next day, a young Canadian policeman who'd been on the job six weeks spotted McNair's van. A chase ensued, and when the van was cornered yet again, McNair took off on foot. But this time, he was being chased down by a young, fit cop. McNair didn't get very far. The cop was later given an award, and in interviews he said McNair laughed and joked with him after he was captured. The game was up now, and the running man was about to face extradition to the US. McNair now resides in ADX Florence, a supermax prison where inmates are locked down 23 hours a day, and when they do leave their cell, they're surrounded by guards. This facility is one place that no man can escape from. That's why it houses international and domestic terrorists, spies, leading gang members as well as infamous organized crime members, and the likes of one El Chapo Guzman. In fact, McNair once talked about El Chapo, and we know that because a Canadian journalist who's been writing to McNair for a long time sometimes posts what McNair says in letters on Twitter. One tweet went like this, I've been a 10-year resident of ADX Florence, and I see a new resident is coming, El Chapo. I look forward to meeting you and sharing breakout stories. If you read that Twitter account, you'll also know why McNair always ran so well. That's because he worked out every single day when he was behind bars. Prison, the final frontier for some folks and a very bad gap year for others. What happens inside those prison walls often stays within those walls, but the horrors and harsh facts do creep out from time to time. We sent our intrepid team of researchers to find out the craziest things that have happened and are happening inside prisons, and what they came back with blew our minds. Welcome to the insane world of the penitentiary. Number 50. It's a fact that anyone who goes to prison has a higher chance of dying than people on the outside. A 50% higher chance. And think about it for a second, aren't there more ways to die on the outside? Maybe, but prisoners in some lockups face mistreatment by guards and the wrath of other inmates on a daily basis. There are also the issues of poor nutrition, not great healthcare packages, stress, and depression. 49. It's well known that the USA locks up more people per capita than any other country. But did you know that in 2019, a staggering 2.3 million Americans were doing time? Over a fifth of the entire world's prison population is in the USA. 48. Some other countries also seem to enjoy putting a lot of people in prison. After the US, next on the list for most prisoners per 100,000 is El Salvador. After that country comes Turkmenistan. 47. An investigation in 2014 found that the portions of food were so small at Gordon County Jail in Calhoun, Georgia, that some prisoners resorted to eating toothpaste. 46. He's a sadist to some and a savior to others, but one thing's for sure, and that's the fact that Sheriff Joe Arpaio is proud of how little to eat he gives his prisoners in Arizona. He gleefully wrote in his biography that his 15 to 40 cent prisoner meals were the cheapest meals in America. 45. We can tell you that this one blew us away, and that's the fact that there are more jails in the US than there are colleges. 44. In 2013 in California, around 10,000 people were released early, but not for good behavior. They were let out because prisons in the state were overcrowded. But here's the punchline. Some people doing time for violent offenses came out when folks convicted of non-violent drug offenses went in. 43. Those people serving time for non-violent drug offenses make up about half of the US's federal prison population. Those offenses are the reason the prison population has quadrupled since the early 1980s. 42. Brazilian prisons were getting so full, the country said, enough's enough, let's come up with a way to reduce the number of people doing time. The government introduced the Redemption Through Reading program, which meant that prisoners could get up to 48 days off their sentence if they read a book. We know what you're thinking, that lots of prisoners could just cheat and skim the book. Well, that wasn't possible because each prisoner had to write a comprehensive book report. This initiative worked in two ways, because the books were giving the prisoners an education as well as an early release date. 41. An American guy named Richard Lee McNair escaped prison a whopping three times and he got pretty creative about how he did it. In 2006, he actually got into a crate and mailed himself out of prison. It didn't end well for this guy since he's now doing time in the maximum security facility ADX Florence. 40. The Aryan Brotherhood gang in the US is bloodthirsty, to say the least. At one point, they were responsible for something like 18-25% to of homicides that took place inside federal prisons. This gang was founded back in 1964 by a bunch of Irish American bikers, and right now there are about 20,000 of them serving time in prisons. 39. 
In 1971, a guy named Joel Kaplan was sitting in cell 10 of the Santa Maria Acatitla prison in Mexico City when a helicopter noisily landed in the prison yard. The guards thought some dignitary from the government had come to visit, but Joel knew better. Some guys came out of the helicopter, collected Joel, and then flew him out of the prison. The story gets much weirder since after Joel made his way back to the USA, he claimed that what he had done was entirely legal. He said no one got hurt and even the helicopter was paid for and met FAA standards. The Mexican authorities might have disagreed with that, but they never asked for extradition. 38. Oklahoma can be proud of being the prison capital of the world. In this state, there are 1,079 prisoners for every 100,000 people. That might not mean much to you, so consider the fact that in the country of Germany, there are 78 people locked up in every 100,000. 37. Here's the very sad story about a man named Jonathan Magby. When he was just four years old, he was hit by a car, and after that he was paralyzed from the neck down. Since he couldn't use his body, a nurse had to care for him and she basically was at his side each and every day. But get this, Jonathan smoked weed now and again because that helped with his condition. The cops didn't much like that and when Jonathan was 27, he was jailed for 10 days for marijuana possession. If that's not bad enough, his carers told officials that this guy needed constant care and he needed a ventilator, which he didn't get while he was behind bars. The awful end of this story is that Jonathan died on his fourth day in jail. By serving and protecting him, they killed him. Yeah, we're guessing that you think we haven't found more insane stories than that. Well, you'd be wrong. It's going to get worse. 36. There's a woman in Thailand who holds the record for being sentenced to the most time for a female criminal. Her name is Chamoy Tipiaso, and after being found guilty of ripping off thousands of ties in a pyramid scheme, she was handed down 141,078 years. Ha! Huh. You might wonder, is there any chance this woman could do the time? Well, it turns out that she only ended up serving eight of those years. 35. Here at the Infographic Show, we like nothing more than to tell you stories about the infamous Alcatraz prison, The Rock, as it was fondly known. Back in the day, when The Rock was the home of the likes of Al Capone and other criminals the US didn't want to escape, the prison had a policy to give every prisoner the availability of hot showers. Wow, you might be thinking, how humanitarian of the authorities. Well, a bleeding heart is not the reason those prisoners got hot, steamy showers. The reasoning was that if they enjoyed the hot water showers, they'd more easily freeze to death if they tried to escape and swam in the cold waters of San Francisco Bay. 34. There once was a man named Troy Leon Gregg and he committed the heinous crime of murdering two people. He was eventually arrested for that and told that he was going to get the death penalty. Fast forward to 1980 and death row at Georgia State Prison. On a warm July night, Troy and some other guys made American history when they escaped from death row. The thing is, Troy's freedom didn't last long. One of the things he did on his first night was to go to a bar, but there he got into a fight with a biker and was beaten to death. As for those other escapees, they were all eventually caught and sent back to prison. 33. In 2019, the Netherlands was having a problem that the US hadn't experienced for a long time. That was the fact that the crime rate was so low, it had to start closing down lots of its prisons. 32. In 1992, there was a riot at Karanjiru Penitentiary in Brazil after a fight in a soccer game got out of hand. The military police were called because the 15 guards had no chance of controlling the more than 2,000 prisoners. What happened next has simply been called a massacre, and that's because those cops just started shooting anyone they saw, even if the prisoners were surrendering. This resulted in the death of 111 prisoners, and not even one injury to a cop. In 2013, for their actions that day, 23 of those cops were sentenced to a total of 156 years. 31. This is the story about an esteemed cancer doctor named Chester Milton Southam. Much of Chester's life was concerned with finding a cure for this terrible disease, but you could say this man might have skipped some of his ethics classes. That's because old Chester injected cancer cells into prisoners at Ohio Penitentiary. Did he get the prisoner's consent before he did this, you might wonder? Well, the short answer is, like hell he did. Don't worry, his ethics or lack thereof were later criticized. 30. We'll stick with this Ohio prison and tell you that in 1930, a terrible fire raged through the building and you can only imagine the terror of that happening when you're locked in a cell. The guards didn't even unlock the doors. Those guys were so fearful of what might happen to them. There's both a happy and a sad ending to this story, because even though 322 inmates died in the fire, many more escaped after some inmates overpowered the guards and started running around opening doors. 29. We just know you're going to think we're making things up now, but we can assure you that this is 100% the truth. In Canada, they have a polar bear jail. Yeah, you heard that right. When those great beasts start causing trouble up in Churchill, Manitoba, they get sent to the polar bear holding facility. The bears do anything from 2 to 30 days behind bars and then get relocated to the wild. 
If you're thinking that no bears actually serve time, then think again because lately the 20 cell facility had to add on another 8 cells. The polar bear crime rate has skyrocketed of late because of what you might call poverty in their natural environment. 28. The Louisiana State Penitentiary has sometimes been called the Alcatraz of the South and even worse, the bloodiest prison in America. Back in the day, it was a hellhole, and that's no exaggeration. At one point, one in every ten prisoners had a stab wound, and if a knife didn't get them, the harsh work would. Things got so bad in the 1950s that 31 inmates completely slashed their Achilles tendons just to bring some attention to the injustices they were suffering. We'd like to tell you that things got better, although just recently the place has been in headlines for its corrupt guards. 27. When Hurricane Katrina happened, you'd think that prisoners in New Orleans would have been taken from their cells. That's what should have happened. But in actuality, hundreds of prisoners were left up to their necks in water in their cells without food or water. The inmates were eventually evacuated after a few days, but they let it be known that when things got bad, the correctional officers just left the facility. 26. In the 1980s, a British drug smuggler, David McMillan, almost escaped from Melbourne's high-security Pentridge prison by helicopter. But that plan didn't exactly work out for him. You just can't hold a bad man down. And years later, McMillan would find himself locked up in Thailand's notorious Klung Prim Central Prison. Things were looking bad for the smuggler, and he knew he had to get out. But how do you do that when not one person has ever escaped from that place? Well, this guy had one thing on his side, and that's the fact that he was very smart. He became the first man ever to escape that prison. And you know what he credits for his successful escape? An umbrella. That's right, he said later he walked off with an umbrella simply for the fact that escapees don't carry umbrellas. 25. There's a place sometimes called the most notorious medieval prison in the world, and that was the Clink. This English prison was opened in 1144, and you might say doing time there wasn't a walk in the park. Some prisoners got 24 hours a day solitary confinement and a diet that consisted of bread and water. Quite a few of them experienced that and then could look forward to being burned at the stake. 24. If you think you've seen some bad overcrowding in prisons, then you have to see the leaked security footage that came from a jail in Thailand in 2019. We can't tell you exactly how many guys are in there in that cell, but it could be something like 80 or even 100. The only way you could get more people in that cell would be if you started piling the bodies on top of each other. 23. In the 1800s, a British man was sent to Australia on a transport ship to serve time on a penal colony. There he got the name of Moondine Joe. He turned to crime again, committing robberies and then hiding out in the bush, and for that the authorities hated him. His luck ran out when he was caught, and this time the authorities made sure he wasn't going to escape. He had to serve a sentence in a nice pair of leg irons, but Moondine Joe still managed to escape. His plan now was to walk through that bushland and virtually cross Australia, but the cops once again got their man. Ok, so they had him, and this time he definitely wasn't going to escape because the warden had built a cell especially for Joe. It was basically a concrete box. So how could Joe get out of that? The local governor even said to him, if you get out again, I'll forgive you. Guess what? He got out. Joe made a hole in one of the walls and off he went into the sunset. After that, he tried not to commit any more crimes, but after a few years, he started robbing again. He was captured again, of course, but the governor was true to his word and had Joe removed from prison. 22. You could say that no one on this planet has been as adept at escaping from prison as Moondine Joe, but that's when a Japanese man named Yoshi Shiratori steps up and says, hold my beer. Shiratori is famous for four successful prison escapes. 21. Back in the 1960s, one guy whose name you saw a lot was Timothy Leary, and that's because he became kind of a guru in the hippie counterculture. Leary believed that psychedelic drugs held powers that could help mankind, and he wanted to prove it. He got his chance when he took part in something called the Concord Prison Experiment. This involved Leary giving consenting prisoners doses of psilocybin, aka magic mushrooms. The question was, would those guys who did the mushrooms quit crime when they got out of prison? The answer was that 20% of the guys who took part in the project went back to crime after prison, while 60% of the other American criminals at the time did the same. 20. When you're doing time in Iceland's Kviabreja prison, you can enjoy rooms with exceptional views and even get out now and again to do some shopping in the market. The rooms all have internet and the guys, not the guards, have the keys to those rooms. You might also be surprised to hear that it's a diverse kind of joint with women, men, the old and the young all mixed together and helping each other do their time. 19. In the USA, around 75% of prisoners will end up back in prison within five years after their release. 18. In Norway, only around 20% of released criminals will end up back in prison. 17. Not so many people know this, but Senator John McCain actually did time behind bars. The senator was flying a plane in the Vietnam War, and that plane was shot down. 
He ejected out of the thing, but doing so, he broke both arms and a leg. McCain was captured and then sent to Holo Prison, aka the Hanoi Hilton. He was beaten, and you can imagine how that felt when he already had some bad injuries. He did eventually get some treatment, but after a few weeks the poor guy had lost 50 pounds. If that wasn't bad enough, he later did a two-year stretch in solitary confinement. Could it possibly get any worse, you might wonder? The answer is a resounding yes. He was interrogated a few times a week, and during those sessions he was bound and savagely beaten. The man spent five and a half years as a prisoner of war, and because of his injuries, until the day he died he still couldn't lift his arms above his head. 16. Perhaps the worst kind of prison might be one with no doors. Yes, you heard that right. A prison you're just left to die in. This is a form of punishment called immurement, and it basically involves having a cell built around you. This happened to a Moroccan serial killer in 1906. He was walled up and screamed for days on end. Since he had no water to drink, those screams didn't last long. 15. If you've ever visited the city of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, you might have walked down a quiet back street and found a former prison. It's now called the Tul Slang Genocide Museum. Before this place was a prison used by the communist Khmer Rouge during their bloody takeover of the country, it was just a school. When the soldiers of the uprising got hold of the place, they turned it into a torture and execution center and called it Security Prison 21 or S21. Walking from room to room, you see numerous torture devices and photos of all the families that were killed there. Another room is filled with their skulls. Tool Slang was a prison where people were sent to be tortured and killed. Women, children, and of course men. They'd been accused of, well, not being on the right side of politics. They were just your average student, teacher, doctor, engineer, soldier, sailor. We won't talk about the horrific devices they used to torture and ultimately kill them, but needless to say, imprisonment there was worse than you can imagine. Our researchers at the infographic show have been to this place, and we can assure a visit is absolutely heartbreaking. 14. When Alcatraz was up and running as a prison, there was a rumor that the waters around the island were full of man-eating sharks. That's not exactly the truth, but it probably prevented a few men from trying to escape. A great white has been spotted there in the past, but that was very unusual. Certain kinds of sharks might swim in that water, but not the kind that will munch down on a man. We're getting close to the top 10 now, so expect to see something special. 13. Japanese prisons are well known for being really, really strict. An American man who was sent there in the 90s said he got 10 days in solitary just because he looked up before eating. That was a big no-no, of course. 12. What you're about to hear is possibly one of the most outrageous prison stories ever. In 2017, at an Ohio prison, an investigation revealed that some very clever inmates had made two computers and hid them in the ceiling. A computer by itself wasn't very useful, but the guys connected the devices to the state's Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections network. The only reason those guys got caught was because the prison realized that daily internet usage was exceeding the threshold. The good news is that those men had obviously learned a lot in their prison electronics class. 11. What's called the most violent prison riot in American history happened in 1980 at the New Mexico State Penitentiary. In short, the prison was taken over by the prisoners, and guards and inmates were taken hostage. None of the guards were killed, but we can't say that for the captured inmates. What happened is some of the gangs that were leading the riot took over the prison. They rampaged through the cell blocks, and if they couldn't get through a door, they used a blowtorch to get through it. On the other side, there were guys who were in protective custody, and some of those people ended up being tortured, hanged, dismembered, and killed in other terrible ways. We hate to tell you this, but that blowtorch that they had was used on the faces of men deemed snitches. 33 people in the end were killed. 10. There was a special dungeon in the Tower of London called Little Ease, and the thing was, when you got sent there, you got Little Ease. That's because it was so small a person couldn't lie down. It was a tiny little box and must have driven prisoners mad. 9. In every prison you have a guy that makes hooch. Well, you have a lot of guys that do that, and they make the alcohol drink from juice, bread, and bits of fruit. But might throw in all kinds of things. We found one guy who considered himself a hooch master when he was doing time, but one thing he got wrong one time was when he didn't burp the bottle enough. That means letting out some gas. He didn't do that, and things blew up in his face. If you ever decide to become a hooch master, then we suggest you get down with burping your brew. 8. After a study that was conducted about a giant Los Angeles jail, it was found that 800 people did 200 days in that jail before they were found innocent or guilty. 7. You might think that there's just no way you'd ever end up in jail, but listen how some people got there. Okay, so not paying a parking ticket can land you in jail, but it gets much worse than that. A few years ago, a 19-year-old man in Michigan did three days behind bars because he had not paid a fine for catching a fish. What? You're thinking? Well, we should tell you that he wasn't supposed to catch that kind of fish at that time of year. His crime was out-of-season fishing. We found an 82-year-old in Maryland whose beloved chihuahuas kept getting out of the house. How's an old woman supposed to keep those little things under control? She got fined, couldn't pay, and went straight to jail. 
she served two days. So don't think that you could never end up in jail. 6. In 2011, death row inmates in Texas no longer had the option to have a last meal before their execution. You might wonder why. The answer is because a senator in the state got quite upset when one prisoner ordered a massive meal and then ate none of it. The guy ordered two chicken fried steaks, some fried okra, about a pound of barbecue, three fajitas, a triple meat bacon cheeseburger, a meat lover's pizza, a cheese omelet with ground beef, tomatoes, onions, and bell and jalapeno peppers, and lastly, a pint of ice cream and a slab of peanut butter fudge with crushed peanuts. All of that came and the prisoner said he no longer felt hungry. That was enough to make some officials angry, and last meals became a thing of the past. Five. In 2007, a lady named Lucille Kepin was released from a US prison and it made the news. That's because she was the oldest female in the country before her release. The 93-year-old had served five years for shooting her neighbor. 4. In 1926, an Australian man named Bill Wallace shot a guy because that guy started smoking near Wallace. Smoking indoors was all the norm back then, but Bill didn't really like the smell. He went to prison and never came out again, but guess how old he was when he finally passed away within those walls? The answer is 107 and 11 months. He did a total of 63 years. 3. In 2019, at a prison in Arkansas, the officers were a bit embarrassed when a prisoner just seemed to disappear. Where is the guy, they wondered. One minute, he was there, and the next, just gone. A manhunt was soon underway and those red-faced officers took dogs into a nearby rural area, knowing the guy couldn't have gotten far. They found him in the end, but not outside of the prison, he was found hiding on the roof. 2. You won't be surprised to hear that life ain't easy for some folks on death row. They sit in solitary confinement and just wait and wait until it's time to lay down on that gurney and take that toxic potion into their veins. The waiting can cause something called death row syndrome, which basically means they go mad. One guy who said death row was like living in a submarine or a cave had his execution delayed because he was in no fit state to die. Others might start talking to themselves or even have psychotic delusions. You can sure get low on death row. And number one. It's a rough estimate, but it's thought that 46,000 to 230,000 people in U.S. prisons are actually innocent. Since 1992, 20 people in the U.S. have been exonerated from death row because of DNA evidence. The records show that there have been 2,551 exonerations in America, and those guys in total did 22,540 years behind bars for something they didn't do. Now that might be the most insane fact we have for you. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman sits at his cell in ADX Florence, the USA's so-called escape-proof lockup. He hasn't seen any natural light in years. He has to sleep with the lights in his cell on, something he says causes extreme mental anguish, and when he does get to leave his cell for an hour a day, he's just transported to another kind of cell by prison officers who barely speak to him. As prison officials have admitted, this kind of incarceration is a fate worse than death, but they also know that El Chapo has pulled off the unbelievable before, and perhaps he's thinking about doing it again. Today you'll find out why this man is about as locked down as lockdown gets, and if indeed El Chapo could somehow disappear again from the clutches of the law. He did once say, I've tunneled out of prison before, and I can do it again. We'll talk about the possibility of a breakout happening later, but let's first look at how El Chapo became known as the drug lord of the underworld. Say what you want about El Chapo, but you can't deny he was an industrious little fella. He was born into poverty on April 4, 1957, in a little place called La Tuna in Sinaloa, Mexico. This was a small rural community where many people made their money from farming. That's what his parents did, his pop Emilio Guzman Bustillos and his mother Maria Consuelo Loreda Perez. Life was hard for El Chapo, his two younger sisters, and four younger brothers. It was so hard that he actually started out having three older brothers, but they all died from natural causes very early in life. And what did these farmers, cattle ranchers by trade do to make ends meet? They branched out, of course, into opium, the stuff that can end up as heroin flowing through the veins of folks north of the border. El Chapo was special, and he showed that from a very young age. He gave up school when he was in the third grade and barely being able to read or write, decided to go into business himself. To help the family out, he sold oranges and candies, although it was never enough to make his violent father happy. His mother, though, she saw something in the kid. She'd watch him as he cut up little pieces of paper, tied them into bundles with elastic bands, and pretended he was rich. She later said about that, he'd count and recount them, then tie them up in little piles. Ever since he was little, he always had hopes. El Chapo left that godforsaken home when he was 15 and everything changed. This kid with big ambition saw a way out of poverty. His ticket to success lay in an illegal commodity, 
that of marijuana, a plant that could be grown cheaply and sent to the USA, where it could fetch enough money to make El Chapo a happy young man. It was at this point that he started working under the tutorship of his uncle, Pedro Aviles Perez. Perez, nicknamed the Mountain Lion, was what you'd call a first-generation Mexican narco, being one of the original entrepreneurs to flood the US with copious amounts of Mexican weed. The stuff was smoked with abandon by the many members of the so-called counterculture in the US in the late 60s and early 70s. But the problem with weed is it stinks a fair bit and it's pretty bulky. It's hard to say how much it costs because prices differ everywhere and it depends on how much you buy and who you buy it from. But let's say the average cost per kilo is about 2000 bucks. That's not much. But what is a lot is the cost of a kilo of cocaine, which could cost in the region of twenty to $30,000 in the US today. So in the 70s, when disco music was becoming a thing in the US and hippie culture made a way for self-loving group of people who liked snorting rails from nightclub bathrooms, the whole trafficking game changed. Cocaine became the new moneymaker. It still is, but let's save our conclusions about the war on drugs until the end of the show. In 1978, El Chapo's uncle was shot dead by federal cops, probably as a result of him being set up by another trafficker. Then the man called the original Mexican drug lord came onto the scene. He was Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo. This man became the godfather. He was untouchable, having officials and politicians in his pockets and having those connections in Colombia, where the coke was coming from. He made deals with other Mexican traffickers who had their own plazas in what became a federation of traffickers. But then, in 1984, something happened that changed everything. A massive marijuana plantation owned by Gallardo's Guadalajara cartel was raided and burned to the ground by the Mexican military, and it seemed the man that had orchestrated this was a US DEA agent named Enrique Kiki Camarena Salazar. To say that Gallardo was furious would be an understatement. This 1,000 hectare plantation was worth a staggering $8 billion a year for the cartel, so with the help of some corrupt Mexican officials, Gallardo had Camarena kidnapped. The outcome was 30 hours of brutal torture with heavy objects and drills, and Camarena's body being wrapped in plastic and dumped in a field. The DEA was less than pleased, and so launched an investigation. To cut a long story short, that investigation was somewhat successful because by 1989, both Gallardo and his lieutenant, Rafael Caro Quintero, were behind bars. As you know, what tends to happen when arrests are made and some big people go down, a so-called power vacuum starts to form. These are usually torrid affairs that involve a lot of bloodshed as people fight for supremacy. After the Federation was abandoned, various cartels did their own thing. One of them was the Sinaloa cartel. At this point in the late 80s, the cartel was already making millions from trafficking cocaine. In the 90s, it got better, and in 1995, it was solely headed by who the DEA said was the new boss, El Chapo Guzman, after his partner Hector Luis Palma Salazar was arrested. They were good at trafficking too, using a network of tunnels to get the stuff across the border and into the USA. They used aircraft now and again, and perhaps their piece de resistance was putting cocaine into chili pepper cans under the brand La Camadra, and then sending them to the US via trains and trucks. Word on the street is they got around $500 million worth of cocaine across the border using Using this method alone, with the packers in the warehouse apparently getting very high during the stuffing process. It was these fast methods that impressed the Colombians, who gave El Chapo the new name of El Rapido. As El Chapo and co were raking in the millions, some people in the Sinaloa started calling Chapo Santa Claus and Robin Hood, with the reason being that he'd been investing quite a lot of money into the state's infrastructure, and for many people, doing more good than any corrupt politician had ever done. Let's not forget, though, those who stood in his way generally got murdered. Then in 1989, there was a bit of a falling out between the Felix brothers of the Tijuana cartel and the Sinaloa boys. To cut the story short, El Chapo sent one of his main men to meet with the brothers, and that ended with Ramon Felix killing the man. Not only that, the brothers then told their men to murder members of the guy's family to prevent any kind of reprisal. These brothers were insanely dangerous, starting a trend in beheading and at one point throwing someone's innocent family members off a very high bridge. Things were turning ugly in Mexico, and you can be sure that El Chapo wasn't going to take these insults lying down. In the early 90s, his men went on their own killing sprees, taking out members of the Tijuana cartel. And it was at this point that the Mexican government had to take a stance. They couldn't just let blood flow through the streets as it had been doing. Even though a good number of politicians, police, and other officials were getting rich from the proceeds of drug trafficking. In 1992, the Felix brothers opened fire on Guzman with AK-47s as he was driving through the streets of Guadalajara. Guzman got away. Not long after, some of his men, while posing as cops, walked into a nightclub and pretty much shot the place up. Six people were killed, but the Felix brothers were apparently in the bathroom at the time and managed to escape. The bullets kept 
kept flying in this turf war and mothers kept burying their boys. But you could say that the culmination of all this was what happened when Tijuana cartel hitmen turned up at a Guadalajara International Airport on May 24, 1993. They'd been informed that El Chapo was there, and he was hiding in a white Mercury Grand Marquis car. Naturally, the men filled the thing with bullets, although they should have checked who was inside it at first because El Chapo was certainly not in the car. But the cardinal and archbishop of Guadalajara named Juan Jesus Posadas Ocampo was. They'd just taken out a man of the cloth, something that spurred Mexican President Carlos Salinas de Gortari into action. El Chapo, by the way, had been at the airport that day, but upon hearing the calamity had made a getaway, something you'll soon see he was very good at, and possibly the best escapologist in Mexican criminal history. So, the president was outraged, the good people of Mexico were outraged, the Tijuana cartel were like, damn, guess we can forget about that ticket to heaven. Their pictures and other suspects ended up in the newspapers with a bounty of $5 million for every head. One of those heads was El Chapo. While in hiding, he handed over $200 million to one of his most trusted men and said, if anything goes wrong, use this to take care of my family. He gave that same amount to some of his other men to ensure that his cartel's business could keep going if he were to be arrested. It was then that he forged a passport using the name Jorge Ramos Perez with the intention of hiding out in Guatemala for a while, although at this point the authorities were hot on his tail. He paid Guatemalan military official a cool $1.2 million to ensure safe passage, but it seems that the official had set El Chapo up. On June 9, 1993, Guatemalan troops swooped in on El Chapo as he was staying at a hotel on the Guatemala-Mexican border. In no time at all, he was sitting on a military plane in handcuffs, thinking about how his first stint behind bars would go at Mexico's Federal Social Readaptation Center No. 2, perhaps one of the best prisons in the world for anyone who has suitcases full of cash at their disposal. Now we come to part two of this show, the first of El Chapo great escapes. But before we do that, we have to ask just how much money this short in stature drug lord had at the time. It's always been a tricky question, foremost because traffickers have said the authorities exaggerate how much cash they have. That cash made from drugs pays for a vast operation that might include up to hundreds of people. On top of that, they hardly file their taxes, and often they keep their money offshore. That's why when they're caught, the authorities never seem to get their hands on the millions or billions. And even if they did, if they were corrupt, would they always report it? Well, look at it this way. There have been cocaine holes in the US of 20 tons. The street price for that would be about $1.3 billion. Sure, as former traffickers have said on podcasts, no one person gets anything close to that. But still, when you consider that there's always cocaine in the US and in Europe, some of the traffickers are making many, many millions, some of them billions. That's even after they paid scores of officials, the suppliers, the transporters, and various middlemen for every shipment. Right now, someone is selling cocaine. Someone is doing some lines, perhaps even in the British Houses of Parliament bathrooms, just as the Prime Minister says he is absolutely determined to fight drugs. That actually happened. There's no doubt people are racking up lines in some of New York's banking offices and certainly at a nightclub or in a living room near you, wherever you are in the world. That's a lot of coke for the cartels to work with. It was said at his height El Chapo was making two to four billion dollars a year, but you can bet your life he never had that at his disposal. Still, he was doing all right just as his enemies were. Just to give you an idea of how much power the cartels had and still have, when that cardinal was shot, the Catholic Church in Mexico didn't think it was a hit gone wrong. Who on earth, they said, would confuse a cardinal for a drug trafficker? They also said, isn't it weird how this murdered cardinal had been talking for a long time about Mexican politicians being in bed with the narcos? They thought it was a purposeful hit on the cardinal with men in suits involved. So, do you really think El Chapo, with his many, many millions and superabundant power, was going to stay behind bars for long? He got 20 years, after which he told the TV cameras, I am but a simple farmer. If he was, it's strange that he had servants in prison, that even the guards were at his beck and call. It's strange that he was treated like a king and was allowed to run his empire from his luxurious cell, and that his brother and business partner Arturo could come and go as he pleased. The investigative journalist Annabel Hernandez said he contacted judges and politicians from there and regularly had sit-downs with business associates. It should also be mentioned here that it was later said in court that El Chapo was working with the DEA, just as drug agencies all over the world sometimes work with traffickers if they agree to set up other traffic. One U.S. critic said El Chapo was duping U.S. agencies into fighting its enemies. Later, the hitman and gangster named Juan Carlos Ramirez testified in a U.S. court saying that Mr. Chapo was bribing corrupt DEA agents with prostitutes, gifts, and apartments. As the years passed, people talked about El Chapo being el dueño of the prison, which basically means the owner. When he was bored with business, he sometimes had prostitutes smuggled in or lovers and often came with a handful of Viagra pills. He did at least have to go through some of the motions that regular 
prisoner's face, and that was seeing a prison psychologist. After meeting with El Chapo, this man gave his assessment, saying he was egocentric, narcissistic, shrewd, persistent, tenacious, meticulous, discriminating, and secretive. We should just say here that during his lifetime, El Chapo had 18 kids with seven different women. One of them was a former police officer named Zulema Hernandez, who wrote to Chapo when he was behind bars. As you know, he wasn't too literate, so when he wrote to her from prison, he had some hired help. One of the letters he wrote gives us some insight not only into how he sounded but also the fact that he was planning to leave. He wrote, Love, Christmas is around the corner and nothing would make me happier than being close to you, your skin and your lips, but everything is uncertain. Even though I haven't lost sight of seeing you, I don't want to promise any specific day because then it doesn't work out. By the way, this woman ended up being shot and killed sometimes later and a Z carved into her body. That's because the hit was the work of El Chapo's enemies, the outfit known as Los Zetas. She'd helped run his drug business from prison but as things tend to go, it was a risky venture. After eight years living in relative luxury, he was indicted in the US for money laundering and trafficking obscene amounts of cocaine across the borders, and it was looking like he might be extradited after the Supreme Court of Mexico made a deal with the US. The last thing he wanted was to end up in a US prison where bribing officers wasn't so easy, so he planned his escape. On January 19, 2001, as one story goes, he bribed prison guard Francisco El Chito Camberos Rivera. The officer opened up the cell and Chapo got in a laundry basket, after which, with the help of a maintenance man, he was rolled out the front door. The maintenance guy helped Chapo into his car trunk and drove him to a gas station, whereupon he went inside to buy something. El Chapo slipped out of the trunk and did that famous vanishing act of his. Camberos did some prison time for that, although the prison authorities had apparently also been paid, as had the cops who didn't bother looking for El Chapo until he'd had enough time to leave the state. This all cost El Chapo in the region of two and a half million dollars. But did it really all go down that way? No, it didn't. According to that brave journalist Annabel Hernandez, she discovered documents and video footage that revealed El Chapo hadn't done the laundry basket thing and instead had left the prison through the door wearing a police uniform. She said that high-ranking cops had all been paid, as had various ministers and prison officials. They'd helped him every step of the way and had been paid handsomely to do so. They even gave him a police escort, and as a matter of convenience, they were at the prison the day after for when they had to go on TV and react to the escape. Pundits have since pointed out that it wasn't just about the money. The government was desperate for the bloody fighting to stop, and it hoped that Chapo would again bring the cartels together with a kind of new Pax Mafiosa, just like that old federation. The same pundit said it was pretty obvious that for a while the only people who got arrested seemed to be El Chapo's enemies, as if the authorities were actually working with the Sinaloa cartel. You can be sure that those enemies were upset about this, believing El Chapo was playing both criminal and informer, which has always been the case with law enforcement and organized crime. As if that wasn't bad enough, El Chapo also had some help from the people who generally don't call themselves criminals or crime fighters. Those were the banks. El Chapo needed to launder hundreds of millions of dollars, and to do that he went through the normal banking system. Invest Investigators would later reveal that he used the American bank Wachovia Bank, now a part of Wells Fargo, and also the largest bank in Europe, HSBC. They both got found out and admitted some wrongdoing, but no one ever went to prison for it. The fines, although large, didn't really make a dent in the bank's profits, and so the authorities and the banks, you could say, both took something from El Chapo's hard-earned blood money. Everyone was a winner, besides El Chapo and the folks that suffered the damage from the actual drugs. The war raged on, and more of the same was about to come. El Chapo and the other cartels ratcheted up the violence after he escaped in 2001. Mexico soon started breaking records, with drug murders going through the roof, as well as tens of thousands of people going missing over the years. The violence also started to get a lot more brutal, as you might have seen in those videos involving kneeling men and chainsaws. At this point, there was still a huge bounty on El Chapo's head, and you can be sure when he traveled he rarely didn't use a bulletproof car. They made some songs about him in Mexico. Now having the status of a legend, it's reported that he'd sometimes roll up at a restaurant with a bunch of armed guards and before walking out pay for everyone who was in the restaurant. People would talk about this new cult figure, saying he's here, he's there, he's everywhere, but the authorities had no idea where he was. They looked from one part of Mexico to the other, raiding houses, making arrests, but the elusive El Chapo was like a ghost. Then, in 2004, after a tip-off, the Mexican Air Force gave him a surprise visit when he was having a party at the Sinaloa Ranch. Helicopters flew overhead and men in masks descended to the ground only to discover El Chapo had once again slipped off.
still, some journalists later said that they never actually intended to arrest him. Yet again, they said the authorities needed to look like they were doing a good job fighting the drug war. Almost the same thing happened again later in 2004, but this time the authorities were only about 10 minutes late. They did at least come away from the raid with El Chapo's laptop and some photographs showing that he had been at the ranch and also put on a few pounds. They burned down the ranch and set fire to his cars, which you can be sure appeared on TV for public consumption. And yet again, there were some Mexican journalists saying the whole thing was for show. How come they were always a few minutes late and how come El Chapo had the escape abilities of the Roadrunner? In 2005, he was seen again, this time eating at a restaurant along with 15 guards brandishing AK-47s. One of El Chapo's men apparently stood up and said to the other eaters, gentlemen, please give me a moment of your time. A man is going to come in, the boss. We will ask you to remain in your seats, the doors will be closed, and nobody is allowed to leave. You will also not be allowed to use your cellulars. Do not worry, if you do everything that's asked of you, nothing will happen. Continue eating, and don't ask for your check, the boss will pay. Thank you. El Chapo then arrived and ordered some steak, after which he shook some hands and left. As promised, everyone got a free meal that day. That's the story anyway. Some people believe people said stuff like that just to create some added mythology behind, for some, a Mexican hero. In 2006, the new Mexican president, Felipe Calderón, assured his people that he would put an end to the violence, declaring a more serious war on drugs using incorruptible forces from the Mexican military. 53,000 people related to the cartels were eventually arrested, but guess what? The Sinaloa cartel was pretty much untouched, with only 1,000 of its members feeling the wrath of the law. Investigations later revealed that Chapo had given some of his own cartel members up and ratted on tons of other cartels after he made a deal with the DEA and Calderon. This help he gave to the US authorities led to that indictment going away in 2008. As these arrests were compelling some US politicians to talk about a significant victory and making El Chapo not very popular with the people he'd given up, cocaine and blood flowed in the streets as it always had done. But now both streams were about to get bigger. Meanwhile, more rumors surfaced that El Chapo had been seen, sometimes in Guatemala or Honduras or, again, showing some largesse in Mexican restaurants. Apparently one time he did that in Juarez, the home of the Juarez cartel, and after they found out, they burned the place to the ground. In 2009, the Mexican government said anyone who gives us information leading to the arrest of El Chapo would receive 30 million Mexican pesos, and at that same time the US government put a $5 million bounty on his head. That was nothing in the great scheme of things, with experts saying the drug war cost the US $50 billion per year, and hundreds of millions were spent just on catching El Chapo. Later in 2009, El Chapo met with some of his top guys, and according to the documents that were later obtained, he told them that if push came to shove, they had to defend the drug shipments at all costs, even if it meant opening fire on US or Mexican authorities. Some members of the Mexican church said they knew El Chapo was in a town called Guanaceve in northwest of Mexico, a place famous for its gold mines and tasty enchiladas. The Roman Catholic Archbishop Hector Gonzalez said that, to which the president warned him not to speak to too loosely if he didn't know the facts. Not long after that, some undercover military officers entered the town, only to be later found dead with a sign on them saying, you'll never get Chapo. The rumors of his whereabouts persisted, with some saying he was now traveling under a false name as far away as Argentina, Paraguay, and Colombia, even to Europe. The DEA thought that, but said most of the time he hid out like Osama bin Laden in parts of Mexico where the terrain was rough and any sign of helicopters or trucks would be seen from far away. Still, there is evidence that he did travel often and again to places such as Argentina, Honduras, and Guatemala, and plenty of folks in Mexico from time to time were on the receiving end of a free meal when El Chapo turned up at their favorite eatery. Then on February 21, 2012, after being tipped off by the US, Mexican cops again missed El Chapo when they raided a mansion in Los Cabos, Baja California, sir. He had apparently arranged to meet a sex worker there, but after she told him it wasn't a good day for sex, he rescheduled. Cops arrested her, as well as one of El Chapo's chefs and his pilot. It was beginning to look like El Chapo had a crystal ball, but as you know, that was not the case. He flew around in private jets and changed up how he communicated with his men, and it seemed as though they'd never get him. The US even made a secret plan to send in the Navy SEALs, which consisted of sending men in by land and by air, and if they met any resistance from El Chapo's men, their orders were to shoot to kill. It never happened because the Mexican armed forces didn't like the plan. In 2013, it was rumored that he'd been shot and killed in Guatemala, but this was more nonsense. Even WikiLeaks shared some information saying he was indeed in northern Guatemala, but very much alive. More intelligence said he had been in various hospitals to deal with his diabetes and heart disease, a consequence partly down to him putting on stacks of weight. Then there came a break in the investigation. 
Dutch cops arrested Jose Rodrigo Arachinga Gamboa, who at the time was the boss of the Sinaloa cartel's assassin squad, Los Anthrax. They also got one of El Chapo's top logistics guys, and so now the DEA had a fair bit to go off in terms of how the cartel's communications and movements went. They believed that El Chapo was getting tired of hiding out all the time and was spending more of his time eating out at nice restaurants in Sinaloa's largest city, Culiacan. One time, he'd ordered one of his runners to pick up the meal. That was Hidalgo Arguello, and he was arrested at the restaurant. He led them to El Chapo's ex-wife's house, but when they got there, El Chapo was gone. The Mexican authorities soon tracked a signal coming from what they believed was Chapo's phone, and in time they were breaking down a reinforced door which they believed would finally lead them to their man. Inside this safe house were cameras and monitors, but no El Chapo. What they didn't know at the time was as they'd been trying to bash down that door, El Chapo had used one of his tunnels to escape. He hadn't crawled pretty far by the time they found a bathtub that could be raised using hydraulics. They soon discovered that once raised, there was an opening to a staircase that led to a tunnel. And off they went, moving much faster than the portly gangster. The Mexican Navy were the ones in pursuit in the tunnel. In the streets above was the Mexican Army, and they were out in force. In the air, a U.S. drone was circling around. Not even the great Houdini could have got away from this lot, but all the Navy ended up finding was an end to the tunnel at a river. Little did they know that El Chapo had used a sewage system that took him to a storm drain. There, he and his right-hand man, a former Mexican Armed Forces commando named Ju Ramirez, fled in a vehicle. It was Ramirez's phone that the authorities later picked up via signals, which told them he was now in the city of Mazatlan. The next evening, February 21, 2014, the Mexican Navy, the DEA, the U.S. Marshal Service, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security were in Mazatlan, either hoping to capture El Chapo and Ramirez or at least just get Ramirez. A phone signal led them to the Miramar condominiums, but not the exact room. The first room that was busted open belonged to two American tourists, but when they stormed into the room, number 401, they found Ramirez armed with an AK-47. He didn't put up a fight. In another room, they found a babysitter and El Chapo's two young girls, Molly and Maria. He was in another room with his wife. No shots were fired. El Chapo was roughed up a bit, but he never went for a nearby rifle. El Chapo suddenly just looked like your average father as they marched him past a bowl full of fruit in the kitchen in his $1,200 a month apartment. Finally, they had him, and what an exhaustive and expensive chase it was. You'd hope that this time they wouldn't let him escape again. El Chapo had other ideas. The U.S. authorities were now happy, hailing the capture as one of the most important in the annals of crime history. Attorney General Eric Holder said it was a landmark achievement, adding the criminal activity Guzman allegedly directed contributed to the death and destruction of millions of lives across the globe through drug addiction, violence, and corruption. The U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, was similarly made up, saying on TV, we can congratulate our Mexican partners in this achievement. It was now time to get him back to the U.S. where he could face the music. But first, he had to be transported to the maximum security prison, Federal Social Readaptation Center No. 1. His ride was in a Black Hawk helicopter followed by two more helicopters. This time, El Chapo was certainly not going to use the prison as an office or a place to make out with one of his hired sex workers. There would be no business meetings and no running about in the yard. His room was barren. He had no contact with other inmates. His family was only allowed to visit him with a judge's approval and only once every nine days. There was one bed, one shower, and one toilet in a room that was incredibly dingy. Watching his every move was a security camera. It was 23 hours a day like this, and even when he was allowed out, he wasn't allowed to see other prisoners. The officers were even told never to talk to him unless giving him an order. The man, who not long ago appeared on the Forbes Rich List as a billionaire, was given a government-approved 48 bucks a month to buy products for personal hygiene. There was no way of getting money in from the outside. His days were spent alone in that cell. That might seem somewhat extrajudicial, but the fear was that Chapo had escaped before, and if he had any chance to wield his massive wealth, he might do it again. The Mexicans filed charges against him relating to drug trafficking and organized crime, while the U.S. was busy filing for extradition. Then, in April 2014, the Attorney General of Mexico dealt a blow to the U.S. when he declared that he wanted El Chapo to face the charges on his home turf. He said he feared the U.S. would grant him some leniency for giving other criminal figures up. As time passed, questions were asked about just how solitary Chapo's confinement was. In July, he and another drug kingpin went on a hunger strike over the poor conditions in the prison. Something like 1,000 other prisoners joined the strike. But since El Chapo was not supposed to be able to communicate with other prisoners, how did he manage it? The Washington Post wrote, The world's most fearsome drug lord was now apparently a human rights crusader, but that he had the freedom of movement and communication inside the prison to pull it off. That's a question you need to think about as we head further into this unbelievable story. In September, a U.S. court indicted Chapo for his drug empire and also for using a team of trained assassins to commit hundreds 
hundreds of acts of violence, including murder, assault, kidnapping, assassination, and acts of torture. Those were some pretty serious charges, but again, Chapo's lawyers managed to get an injunction against the extradition on the grounds that under the Mexican constitution his rights would be violated in the US. It was finally decided that El Chapo should first serve his sentence in Mexico, which would mean dying in a Mexican prison, seeing as his sentence was going to be 300 to 400 years. This was what was going on in July 2015, just over a year since El Chapo had been in prison. No one ever expected him to get out. He would die an old man behind bars. Then on the evening of July 11th, he was suddenly gone. This time, his Houdini trick would shock the world. No one in history had pulled off anything like this. He'd last been seen by the security cameras at 8.52 p.m. That's when he went to take a shower. The spot where he did that was the only place in his cell that the security cameras couldn't pick up. He seemingly walked into the shower and just disappeared. And when officers went to inspect, he had indeed just vanished. Below the shower, the authorities found a small hole in the ground with PVC piping acting as a ladder. This led down into a tunnel, and not a small tunnel either. It was replete with tracks at the foot of it and connected to those was a motorcycle that had been adapted to run on the tracks. That bike wasn't so much for a fast getaway for El Chapo, but for the people who'd been doing all that digging down there. It was estimated that the earth that had been removed could have filled up something like 350 trucks, something that would have taken a year using that small bike as transport. About one mile from the start of the tunnel was the end, which was inside a half-built house. El Chapo had his people construct something which didn't really make any of the nearby farmers suspicious. They later said that sure, they saw someone building and moving what appeared to be a lot of dirt and sand, but so what? That kind of thing was normal. Seriously, did no one at all in the prison know this was going on? A lot of pundits said someone must have been in on it. And that's likely why El Chapo was able to start that protest in prison. Maybe they said his confinement wasn't exactly what the public had been told. One of those pundits said, here's a guy who time and again has proven he could build a hole in the ground. If they're not looking at every single piece of soil around where they have that guy locked up, then they don't have the willingness. Talk about the Mexican authorities having egg on their face. Not to mention the US feeling like some more millions of dollars had gone to waste chasing this man. How had tunnels not been suspected when the authorities knew El Chapo had a thing for building them? The man was like a mole on steroids. Digging was his thing. After his arrest in 2014, they found several tunnels leading from various houses in the city of Culiacan, not to mention all those so-called super tunnels his cartel had used to get cocaine under the US border. El Chapo was to tunneling what Ted Bundy was to killing, and you'd have never let Bundy alone in a prison cell with a pretty young woman in a hammer lying nearby. Chapo's guys hadn't even rushed the tunnel, making it two feet wide and more than five feet high, big enough for El Chapo to stroll through rather than crawl and get dirty. It had ventilation inside and was fitted with lights. The only thing missing, perhaps, was a bar at the end where the diggers could have a beer after a hard day's work. It was a total embarrassment for all involved, with the authorities declaring states of emergency in nearby areas and closing down the closest airport. The chase was on, again and it was one massive manhunt. As heavily armed cops stopped vehicles all over Mexico State, inside the prison around 30 employees were held back and interrogated. A US professor who wrote about crime trends around the globe told the New York Times, it's almost Mexico's worst nightmare, and I suspect many in US law enforcement are apoplectic right now. This is exactly why they wanted him extradited. They didn't trust the Mexican prison system to hold the man down and to think that when the Mexican general attorney announced to the world that El Chapo was not going to be extradited before he served out his time in Mexico, when someone talked about the escape risk, he shrugged it off and said, it doesn't exist. You won't be surprised to hear he was replaced after El Chapo got away again. Around this time, seven officials, including two members of Mexico's Secret Service and some prison staff were arrested. Six others were also put in handcuffs and prison directors and staff were fired. It's still not clear who helped him escape from the inside, if anyone at all. It might have only been the work of his family and cartel. To make matters worse for the authorities, soon after El Chapo escaped, a Twitter account bearing his name seemed to taunt those who were after him. Writing in Spanish, he basically told Donald Trump that he could eat his own poop. He also wrote, life takes many turns, one day you're in the hole and the next day you're on top. He addressed one tweet to the Mexican president saying, don't call me a delinquent because I give people work, unlike you, you cowardly politician. Another tweet said, never say never, this world keeps turning, in this life he who risks nothing cannot win. That certainly enshrouded El Chapo with more legendary status. So you have to ask, how did he manage to get on Twitter so fast? According to the US media, those tweets very likely came from El Chapo's hand. Now, Interpol had been given the warning. Airports were on the lookout for him. Helicopters scoured the skies. Police were stopping cars all over nearby cities and towns. These were desperate times, especially as the days passed and El Chapo didn't turn up. They were so desperate that the Mexican government asked for the help of Colombian officials who'd helped hunt down members of the Cali and Medellin cartels. What no one knew 
knew right then was how he'd gotten away, or not the full story anyway. It turned out that once he'd gotten to that half-built house, he'd been taken on the back of an ATV to a warehouse. He was then taken to another city where a private plane picked him up and took him to a hideout in the mountainous area of Latuna in his state of choice, Sinaloa. And that's where he decided it was time to get more famous and rub shoulders with a Hollywood superstar. El Chapo had first gotten acquainted with celebrities a few years earlier when he was contacted by one of Mexico's most famous actresses, Kate Del Castillo. She shocked the world in 2012 when she announced this about the murderous drug kingpin. Today, I believe more in El Chapo Guzman than the governments that hide all the truths. She then wrote a letter to Mr. Chapo. Yeah, she actually addressed him as Mr. Chapo, which stated, Don't you think it'd be great if you could start trafficking with positive things? Her answer to his problems and problems at large was that he should start trafficking in love. Now, you'd think El Chapo would have almost choked on his ceviche de sierra when he saw that, but no, it seems he took a liking to her. In 2014, El Chapo's lawyers got in touch with her and while he was on the run a year later, they talked about making a movie about his life. This is where the actor Sean Penn comes in. Through Castillo, Penn and Chapo got in touch and the two agreed to meet at Chapo's hideout in the mountains. Sean Penn knew there'd be a certain amount of hood over the head stuff going on and he understood he was meeting with a very dangerous man, writing, I'd seen plenty of video and graphic photography of those beheaded, exploded, dismembered or bullet riddled innocents, activists, courageous journalists and cartel enemies alike. When Penn arrived, Chapo told him he was born poor and he hadn't been given many opportunities in life, even saying he wasn't really a violent man. He also said, I supply more heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine and marijuana than anybody else in the world. I have a fleet of submarines, airplanes, trucks and boats. That communication almost gave him away because the Mexican authorities tracked some signals and proceeded to raid the hideout. He escaped again and got on a helicopter as the authorities were right behind him. They said they didn't shoot because El Chapo was with two women and a young girl. The women were his chefs. But now the US authorities were more peeved than ever. This man was now talking to Hollywood stars for God's sakes, and yet the country had been chasing him around for years and spending many, many millions of taxpayer dollars dollars to do so. It was then decided another Mexican-American operation would be launched, this time called Operation Black Swan. The US Army's elite counterterrorism unit, Delta Force, wouldn't be involved in any actual raids but helping by giving tactical advice. The Mexican Navy had heard that at a coastal town in Sinaloa called Los Mochis, armed guards had been spotted at a certain house. They put the house under surveillance, hearing one night, January 8, 2016, someone special was about to arrive. That night, a large order for tacos was placed at a restaurant, enough to please El Chapo and a bunch of bodyguards. They raided the place early in the morning, not really knowing who'd be there but assuming at least some of Chapo's top men. Cops, the army, and 17 highly trained specialists from Mexico's special forces kicked down a door and opened fire. Five of Chapo's men were killed there and then, another six were injured compared to one of the Special Forces men. Lying next to the bloodied men was a total of eight assault rifles, two M16s with grenade launchers, two Barrett M82 sniper rifles, a loaded RPG, and outside were two armored cars. El Chapo as always was well hidden and as soon as he heard the gunshots he lifted up a mirror that was covering an entrance to another one of his very useful tunnels. Alongside him was his chief assassin, El Cholo Ivan. One tunnel led to another tunnel, and eventually the men got out and attempted to get far away from the scene in a stolen vehicle which they'd held up at gunpoint. Cops all over the state were alerted to the license plate number of the vehicle and in no time, El Chapo and his sicario were stopped. He offered those cops a huge amount of cash, houses, cushy jobs, anything they wanted, but this time the bribe was rebuffed. El Chapo looked at them and said, you're all going to die. Those four cops on the scene radioed through to their bosses and were told something like 40 assassins were on their way to free El Chapo and his assassin. In no uncertain terms, they were told to go straight to a motel and wait there for the special forces to arrive. They did, and at last, again, El Chapo was in the hands of the authorities. He was taken to Mexico City and flown by helicopter to the prison he'd escaped from, and there he was greeted by some men that wanted a serious chat with him. Yet again, Mexican and US officials praised the great work of both sides and hailed this capture as a great success in the never-ending war on drugs. They didn't say never-ending, but as you'll soon see, getting El Chapo out of the way had virtually no effect on the flow of drugs into the US and around the world. Chapo and his lawyers tried to fight extradition, but this time it did not work. One of the Mexican judges involved with the extradition went out jogging one morning and was assassinated, but it still went through. On January 19, 2017, El Chapo arrived on US soil to great media fanfare. On July 17, 2019, El Chapo was told he'd be serving a life sentence plus 30 years at an American prison. He was also ordered to pay back some of the money he'd earned, which officially was $12,666,181,704. None of that was found, and it's still missing. 
The question is, could El Chapo actually escape again? We think the answer is a resounding no. He sits in a cell for 23 hours a day in a prison that is located in the middle of nowhere. Even if you could dig a tunnel, you'd be spotted at some point since there is nothing around for miles. ADX Florence has the most modern surveillance in any prison, which includes sensor pads all over the floors if someone somehow went for a walk around. That will never be possible. Even when Chapo does get out of his cell, he's taken to another roofed area by a five-man team. That area also doesn't have natural light. As a former official at this prison said, El Chapo's life is now a fate worse than death. El Chapo himself said, It's been torture. The most inhumane situation I've lived in my entire life. It has been physical, emotional, and mental torture. You won't be surprised to hear that there was another turf war in Mexico after El Chapo became absent, leading to record-breaking murder rates, mostly drug war deaths, in 2017 and 2018. The rate went down somewhat in Mexico as lockdowns hit the world in 2020, but drug abuse went up in many countries as people dealt with the fallout of a deadly virus. And now the US has a new drug trafficking enemy number one in the Jalisco New Generation Cartel's El Mencho. He is one of the most wanted men in the world, with the US now offering a $10 million reward for his capture as well as Mexico offering a handsome reward. But again, he's just one man in a giant network of mostly formerly poor men who accept the risks of selling drugs when the rewards are so incredibly high. Taking El Chapo out of the mix did nothing at all to reduce drug supply and use in the US and elsewhere, leading one Harvard academic to state, we are choosing to throw money away to stop something we are never going to stop. So all that bragging and boasting about locking up El Chapo is meaningless. He isn't alone in thinking that. With many experts and media saying the war on drugs has been a catastrophic failure on an unprecedented level in terms of the misery and death it's caused in the wake of not working. The prisons are overflowing, the shootings are still happening, and addicts still die, sometimes from pharmaceutical drugs in the mix. John and Jane from just about any city or town near you can go outside and easily buy a gram bag of this or that. It hardly matters where you are in the world, which is testament to the failures of the war and the veracity of its soldiers. Also, as experts following the war have written, when law enforcement does have some success and puts a leak in the drug pipeline from time to time, it almost always ends with even more extreme violence as products go missing causes paranoia and chaos. On top of that, Human Rights Watch said a while back that most of the arrests in this war, 80% of them are for possession, not sales or trafficking, and many habitual users do what they do because they need help, not prison, where drugs are usually plentiful. Since the war on drugs started, it's cost over $1 trillion in the US alone, but this industry of misery costs tons of money in just about every country. Nonetheless, just to dismantle the various industries it supports, prison, justice, law enforcement, and many more, would mean disrupting the economy, and also getting tough on drugs has always been a useful tactic for politicians to amass more votes. Still, as the arrest of Mr. Chapo shows, which is just a microcosm of the war on drugs at large, while drugs remain illegal, there's always more El Chapos. We'd like to give you a number as as to how many people this war has killed since it started decades ago with that nice guy Mr. President Richard Nixon, but right now, this writer's mind is somewhat boggled. National Geographic says 2.5 million lives have been lost, and you can take it or leave it. Maybe some say the war on drugs is just the best we can do, but if you want to see what would happen if a country did something radical and decriminalized drugs, look no further than Portugal, which in the year 2001 did just that and decided public health was more important than public order when it came to illicit drugs. Drugs are still there, but things have for the most part changed for the better. Why has the world copied it, asked one British journalist. Many people now think it's only a matter of time before that happens, because as things stand, the war on drugs makes the grade for how Albert Einstein once described the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Some 70,000 convicts were sent here, but very few made it out alive. With conditions harsh enough to shatter the spirits of even the most resilient criminals, this was truly a land of torment, the final destination for many unfortunate souls. Welcome to Devil's Island, the world's most notorious prison to ever be forgotten. Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? With a treacherous landscape and an ominous past, you'd better watch your step because danger lurks in every direction. The name Devil's Island was actually coined by the prisoners themselves, which should give you some clue about the conditions that they lived in. Officially, it was called Banya de Cayenne, otherwise known as the Penal Colony of Cayenne. Located about 9 to 10 miles off the Atlantic coast from Kourou, a small town in French Guinea on the northeastern coast of South America, resides three small rocky islands. These are known as the Salvation Islands, also known as the Ile de Salut in French. In this case, the term salvation would seem like an oxymoron. The smallest of the three islands is Devil's Island, a narrow strip of land about 3,900 feet long and roughly 1,320 feet wide. Don't let the palm trees fool you, this was no island paradise. Today, an overgrown jungle is slowly hiding the remnants of what was once a penal or exile colony. 
a virtual hell here on Earth. Established by the Emperor Napoleon III in 1852, the island was originally used as a leper colony to quarantine people with leprosy before later being used to incarcerate political prisoners and criminals. Throughout a long stretch of time consisting of around 100 years, many were convicted here, including murderers, rapists, and those deemed as an overall threat to society. Some men, however, were sent here despite being innocent of the charges that were staged against them. It didn't matter what category of criminal you were listed under. If you were unlucky enough to be sent here, you endured the same fate as everyone else. Items on the agenda included squeezing into tight living spaces, getting covered in dirt, and being abused by other inmates. Whether you were a petty thief or a savage murderer, you could expect to be stripped of your identity and thrown into the mix. You were forced to cohabit the same environment and mingle with those more dangerous than you. Not surprisingly, fights were a regular occurrence amongst the prisoners, many of which ended in murders that later went unpunished. No one really cared whether people lived or died. Isolated on a treacherous island with no way out, why would anyone bother punishing the prisoners? It only required paperwork, a guide was quoted saying to Alice Obscura during a visit to the island. It was easier, he explained, to let nature take its course and let them die of harsh labor, tropical disease, or a failed attempt to escape. When the prisoners were punished on rare occasions, they were commonly put in isolation for months at a time. Imagine going a long time in a dark room with no one to talk to. Some convicts were even placed in deep 12 by 12 foot holes with bars on top instead of a roof, so that they'd be subject to all kinds of weather conditions without a shelter to protect them. One prisoner was reportedly tied to a tree deep in the jungle as punishment for attempting to attack a guard. He was left to endure the elements, vulnerable to nature's wrath. The next day, he was discovered dead. Out of 70,000-something men, three-quarters of them died from disease, hunger, and mistreatment. Many also fell prey to insects such as ants as well as bats and rats picking at their rotting bodies. Many convicts even died on the way to the island since even the trip in and of itself was extremely dangerous. Many inmates were forced to share tiny cramped cells with one another in filthy conditions. To put this in perspective, these cells were about the same size as the common household bathroom. As an exercise, if you were trying to squeeze your entire family into one, maybe you'd have a better idea of what it might have been like. Say goodbye to your privacy. We wouldn't recommend trying this if you're claustrophobic, though. After 1885, the population of Devil's Island greatly increased as the French government started sending more prisoners, including an influx of more convicts charged with smaller offenses, not just hardened criminals. The conditions became ever more crowded as a result. Prisoners were routinely shackled at night, their legs tied to an iron rod. With the natural desire to shift and adjust your sleeping position throughout the night, it's easy to imagine that this would have been torture. During the day, prisoners were forced to move around in chains, with starvation being common. Many resembled walking skeletons. A lot of prisoners anticipated death and probably welcomed it when it finally came. Though there is a graveyard located on the island to this day, most of the prisoners were not buried there. Due to its hazardous rocks and powerful ocean currents surrounding the island, safe access was only possible using a cable car, which crossed the 60-foot-wide channel between Devil's Island and the main island, Ile Royale. Though on every prisoner's mind, escape was very difficult to achieve. Some might even say impossible. The rough landscape was its own challenge with sharp rocks and piranha-infested rivers, and sharks also posed a serious threat. These killer monsters circled the island constantly, eagerly waiting to feast on the prisoners. They were even said to respond to the ring of a bell like trained dogs whenever it was time to dispose of the corpses. The bodies of the dead convicts were on the menu, loaded into wheelbarrows and dumped into the ocean. The piranhas were basically handed a free meal on a silver platter. Many who tried to escape also perished in the water. One well-known prisoner to be brought to Devil's Island was a man named Captain Alfred Dreyfus. Born in 1859, this French army officer was the son of a wealthy Jewish family. He was accused of selling military secrets to the Germans in 1894 and was put on trial for treason. He was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment and he arrived at Devil's Island on April 13, 1895. His case, however, initiated a 12-year controversy known as the Dreyfus Affair, which made a lasting impact on the political and social history of the French Third Republic. During this time, the French press was highly anti-Semitic, and the evidence that had been used against him was largely fabricated. Dreyfus reportedly cried out, giving a passionate plea. He said, I swear that I'm innocent. I remain worthy of serving the army. Long live France. Long live the army. But it made no difference. Despite having pled his innocence, public opinion welcomed the verdict and wanted him to be sentenced. 
Dreyfus was used as symbolism for anti-Semitic propaganda, spreading popular opinion about the supposed disloyalty of French Jews. Not everyone was convinced, however, and doubt over Dreyfus's guilt spread like wildfire. The case sparked widespread public attention and split France apart into two opposing groups, those who were for his guilty sentence and those who were opposed to it. Dreyfus was eventually pardoned and released once it was realized that he was unjustly condemned, but not before spending over four long, brutal years on Devil's Island. Considering that more than 40% of prisoners did not survive their first year on the island, and few lived to see their release date, Dreyfus was very lucky. He was released on June 5, 1899. He had written a journal detailing his captivity in more than 1,000 letters. So how about those who managed to escape from Devil's Island prison? There are very few who succeeded, one allegedly being Clement Duval in 1901. He was an anarchist who fled to New York City and wrote a book about his imprisonment called Revolte. Another escapee was a man named René Belbenois, who escaped by helping a film company. He earned $100 which he used to bring a Chinese merchant boat to pick him up. When the boat arrived, he hid in it and sailed away. He spent months recovering with a native tribe off the mainland, making his way on foot through South America. He walked through Central America up to Mexico before finally entering the United States. Now that's quite a hike. Belvenois published two books called Hell on Trial and Dry Guillotine, 15 Years Among the Living Dead, which spread awareness about what went on in the penal colony. There must have been something about the island that drove successful escapees into authorship. Why else would they want to recount their experiences by writing books about it? René Belbenois made a mistake by traveling back to his home country of France to argue his case. Upon his arrival, he was immediately captured and returned to the colony to be imprisoned once again. He was eventually released though and went on to live a free life in California where he worked as a technical advisor for Warner Brothers during the making of the 1944 film Passage to Marseille. He also founded Rene's ranch store in the Lucerne Valley and later obtained legal U.S. citizenship in 1956. Perhaps the most popular and infamous escape from Devil's Island was done by Henri Charrière and Sylvain. Born in 1906, Henri Charrière was framed for murder and transported to the prison in 1930 from France. He was otherwise known as Papillon, the French word for butterfly. He earned his name due to the butterfly tattoo on his chest. During his escape, he leapt from a cliff on the island into the sea with his companion, Sylvain, using two sacks filled with coconuts as life buoys. It took the pair three days to drift to the mainland and they somehow managed to avoid being eaten by sharks. Sylvain died shortly after reaching the shore, supposedly due to getting caught in quicksand. It must have been really aggravating for Sylvain to make it all the way across shark-infested waters for three days just to die that way. Henri, on the other hand, was caught and thrown into another prison. The Banya at El Dorado, but was soon released to live a free life in Venezuela from there. After his ordeal was over, Henri wrote a book, Papillon, which detailed his experiences. French authorities attempted to discredit him, denying his claim that he had escaped from Devil's Island. They even went so far as to say Henri was never sentenced there to begin with. Critics go on to say that Henri should have admitted that this book was based on fiction. We'd be curious to know whether you believe Papillon is based on fabricated accounts of events or if French authorities were just trying to cover it up. It seems pretty suspicious to say the least, especially since many aspects of the story bear more than a few similarities to a memoir by another Devil's Island prisoner called Dry Guillotine, which had been written 30 years before Papillon. Nevertheless, Henri's Papillon name continued to live on in infamy upon his death in 1973. To this day, the name Papillon can be found carved in the floor of cell 47 on Devil's Island. There were even movie adaptations made from the story. If you're looking for something to watch tonight, there are two different versions of the film to choose from. We went ahead and did the research for you to make your life a little easier. The ratings on Rotten Tomatoes give an 83% for the 1973 version of the movie Papillon, starring Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. A poorer score of 52% was given for the recent 2017 version of the film. You're welcome. Though the transportation of prisoners to the French penal colony was abolished in 1938, the last of the prisoners continued to remain on Devil's Island for much longer than that. The closure of the facility was delayed upon the outbreak of World War II. Starting in 1946, French penal colonies everywhere were gradually being terminated one by one. Devil's Island, however, was the last to shut its doors in 1953. For the most part, it was largely forgotten by the rest of the world. Today, however, Devil's Island is a popular tourist destination because of its dark past and the fame it acquired from the books and film adaptations of Papillon's story. 
There's a sort of twisted irony in the fact that so many prisoners could not flee the island in the past, but now you can't get on the island even if you wanted to. This is because it's closed to the public. Though you cannot actually step foot on the island itself, however, you can view it offshore from a charter boat. Many also take helicopters over it just to sneak an aerial peek at the ruins. The other two islands in the group, the three Salvation Islands, are open for access to the public and contain some of the original buildings restored as museums. So what's the appeal of visiting exactly? This may be in large part due to the movies, or perhaps some people have a ghoulish sense of curiosity for the atrocities that went on there. Who knows? Like with any story involving a place with a dark past, there are some who claim Devil's Island is haunted. Visitors have said they've seen ghosts of prisoners everywhere in the crumbling ruins. If we could ask, our question for the ghosts would be, if you died wanting to escape the island in life, why spend all your time there after death? Perhaps it's a form of purgatory for those lost spirits who still can't find their way to freedom. What do you think? Is Devil's Island haunted? Would you ever want to visit there as a tourist? Have any of you seen the two Papillon movies we mentioned earlier and did you like them? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video, What Happens in the H Unit at Federal Supermax Prison. Thanks for watching and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.